בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, all the locals, all the visitors, שתבח שמו, ו-lots of uh, wonderful things, a uh, קהילה in the uh, Philippines received their package recently, but we only publicized it today, but uh, every time I think about it, how הקדוש ברוך הוא allows us to be the vessel to share Torah in all four corners of the world, makes us happy, ברוך השם. So uh, we're back here in Aventura, Florida. We're going to do our Ikvita uh, de Meshicha, the era of Meshiach series, based on the Kuntres uh, by Rav Elchanan Wasserman, Allah Shalom. Uh, tonight's uh, shiur will be for a Refua uh, Shlema, for Yosef uh, Yitzchak ben Baila Rochel, Stefan ben Katarina, Itro ben Avraham, Talia bat Sarah, Michal bat Yael, Serach bat Batya, Batya bat Sarah, אורית בת אילנה, רבנית שרה בת uh, ענת, רב אפרים בן שולמית, רב uh, חיים בן uh, ז'ורה, uh, רבנית uh, שולמית בת uh, נג'ימה, הרבנית uh, לבנה בת שרה, ג'ונס uh, בן uh, שרי היילי שרון בת אברהם, אדל בת שרון, אסתר בת ציפורה, רפאל בן אסתר, and also for uh, הצלחה רבה for uh, שאול בן פרזנה, יתרו um, בן אברהם, גבריאל בן אסתר, And our very dear friend, Bezad Hashem, who remains anonymous, that Kadosh Baruch Hu bless him and his wife. And all of Am Yisrael, especially the ones that are uh, helping us and partnering with us to uh, continue do Zikui Rabim, do Kiruv all over the world, Baruch Hashem. Many people watching the Shure Torah, many people learning, doing Tshuva, getting closer to Hashem, getting Chizuk from all types of Keilot, some converting, Baruch Hashem. Our uh, conversion group on uh, WhatsApp continues to grow, and uh, for anybody that has sent me an email and I haven't responded in a couple of months, please don't take it personally. It's just simply I can't catch up. Uh, there's just too many messages every day, and uh, it's hard to get to all of them. But one suggestion I can make, everybody, uh, as far as emails and text messages, if you want an answer right away or within a re reasonable amount of time, I highly, highly recommend you make the message as short as possible, meaning one sentence, two sentences. Do not send me, if you want an answer, don't send me a Megillah. Don't send me your whole life story on the first email with 75 pages of every fact that happened to you from the time you went to kindergarten. And all, it's all important stuff. I am not discounting it, but I simply can't get to it. I can't get to it, and you have something, you know, usually the, you know, the, the email is 95 pages long, and uh, there's only one question at the end. Oh, and by the way, I have this one question. Ask the question. Then we'll get to the other stuff. We'll get to know you over time, especially people that are converting. You know, when you're converting or you do tshuva, you're very, very excited about, uh, you know, where you're at with life, how you've been enlightened with the Torah, with the holiness of the Torah, and uh, you want help, you want to convert, you want to uh, move to a Jewish community, you uh, are saying thank you, whatever the case is, and, uh, and it's all very, very valuable, but the problem is, is that as soon as I see an email that's a page long or longer, I simply, you know, I'm like a deer in headlights. I don't even know what to do with myself because there's just so many other emails in front of you, behind you, and every, every email, every message is critical. Short emails is, is the way to do it. That's the secret. You want to continue sending me your Megillat Estel? Continue doing it and you'll end up waiting for months. Sometimes I simply don't respond. Uh, it just never happens. Uh, especially when it gets closer to Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is like usually a time where I, I uh, do a control alt delete on everything and sometimes erase everything. Because I just have so many, I know I'm never going to get to it. 
you know, I have emails that are four, five, six months old, I pretty much figure out that if he didn't send me an email again by now, you probably figured it out. Let me just answer something more recent. This is the way it is. I'm sorry that it is the way it is, but I don't have that much uh, help. I only have about 45, 50 employees that work for Bezrat Hashem, and unfortunately, a lot of the things that I do, no one else can do. No one else can do. Uh, so uh, some of these things I know I understand are very important, and you need help with it. And I try to give you guys the recommendations, but some people listen, some people ignore. Uh, yet usually the ones that get the most amount of feedback, like there are certain people that I talk to them very often. Sometimes it's a question, two, three, four questions a day. Sometimes it's a few questions a week, sometimes a few times a month. But they get quick feedback. It's not favoritism. It's simply that they're smart with their messages. They send me one sentence. They send me one sentence, which is easy to respond with. They don't send me Megillah at this tale. And uh, I end up responding usually as fast as I can because that's usually the fastest thing to do. Uh, whereas if you send me the whole thing, it's, it's very hard to go through. It takes 3, 4, 5, 10, 15 minutes to read something. And it's just not possible to do. Uh, at least not for me. Maybe Bezod Hashem, if a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives me like Ruach HaKodesh or something and I'll be able to just think and know exactly what you said, you know, maybe, maybe I'll be able to answer all the emails by then. But until then, and until further notice when I tell you guys I have Ruach HaKodesh, Please, please have some mercy on me. Send me shorter messages. Um, but with all kidding aside, we have, oh Hashem, an important shiul. We have a, uh, another important message for Klal Yisrael, for anyone that loves Torah, for anyone that loves Hashem, for anyone that wants to be saved at the time of uh, Mashiach, which is where we are today, whether it's uh, because the Mashiach is around the corner or it's because simply life is getting so confusing that it's very hard to know who to believe, who to do this, where to go, where to say, and, and, and the world is uh, literally in shambles. Right now people are suffering an enormous amount, and uh, we're making a short little uh, film right now, which Bezat Hashem will come out in the next few days, about some of the uh, wonderful people in Eretz Yisrael that we've been privy to help them financially. Over this last month we had this campaign for the uh, people that are struggling financially, uh, with this whole COVID-19 nightmare. Um, and uh, whether this virus is real or the conspiracies are real or uh, whatever else in, in between doesn't matter because the suffering is real. The suffering that these people are having is very, very much real. And it's not a health issue. It's outright money. And you have countless people that simply do not have food to eat. I'm not talking about they don't have a luxury, they don't eat meat on Shabbos. No, no, I'm talking about food, period. Cookies. Nothing. And it's a nightmare to hear the stories every day where you give somebody a, you know, a thousand shekels or a thousand dollars or whatever, depending on the size of the family, and they make it seem as if you're a Mashiach. All you did is just pay for their bills for, I don't know, another week or two or three, whatever it is, or a day. But the reality is that there's just so many people that are struggling right now and it breaks your heart that people that do have, that do have more than they need, simply don't care. Uh, simply don't care. Obviously, many people do. We've already sent tens of thousands of dollars to Eretz Yisrael in the last couple of weeks in addition to all the other things that we do anyway. Uh, and to help quite a few families, but this doesn't even scratch the surface. And the reason why is because many of these families that have Yirat Shamayim, learning Torah, doing mitzvot, fantastic people, they were already struggling before the virus, before the market was shut down, before the economy was shut down, before the world was pretty much uh, put in the position of uh, freeze. And they were already struggling as it is, so now that they haven't been able to work, or they've lost you know, most of their income or all of it, they're now even in a worse shape than they were before. And literally, many of them have gone to the point where they don't have food to eat. Uh, so uh, you know, the message you're gonna see to here today is the same message you'll hear in this little movie. Bottom line is, anyone that has more than what they need, you don't need to be a millionaire. If you're a millionaire, then give more. If you're not a millionaire, but you have more than what you need, simply try to give a little bit more, a little extra. And yes, of course, we're going to have another campaign, another two campaigns coming up. One for the yeshiva, one for the, uh, the holidays, because we're also going to help them for the holidays. But don't worry about those campaigns. Worry about today. Whatever you can do, help, for heaven's sake. 
People simply don't understand how far a hundred dollars goes, or how far a thousand dollars goes, or how far you know all these all this money goes because you literally can feed people, and it's chaval chaval that you have many people not understand that a kadosh baruch hu is going to feed them anyway. Like I'm not trying to give you guys the message that if you don't do it, they're going to die. They're not going to die. Bezot Hashem, they're all going to live and they're all going to eat. The question is, are we smart enough? to take advantage of a Kadosh Baruch Hu's, a Kadosh Baruch Hu's simple favor to us to make us a vessel to help people. That's it. He's going to feed them one way or the other. Just like David HaMelech says in the Birkat HaMazon, which is from Tehilim, and we see from the Torah, and so on and so forth, a Kadosh Baruch Hu poteach et yadecha umazbiya lekol chayratzon. He opens his arms, he opens his hands, and he feels all of the living. Whether it's the little ant, or it's a big lion, or it's a human being uh, that's uh, not even Jewish, but is decent enough, or it's a human being that's terrible, enemy of Hashem, or it's a Jew that's righteous, or it's a Jew that's a Rasha. HaKadosh Baruch feeds everybody. He feeds everybody. But the question is, are we smart enough to take advantage? Why? Because Gemara says, Tonostrophus, which was a heretic of his day, like a Manus Friedman of his day, and he came to Rabbi Akiva constantly with debates. And he said to him, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves you people, how come he makes poor people? How come he makes poor people? If he loves you, why does he make you poor? Let, let, let the uh, idol worshippers be poor. be obvious that he doesn't like them. Why does he make Jewish people that learn Torah, do mitzvot, do everything? Why does he make them poor? Rabbi Akiva says, Rabbi Akiva says, to help us, to help us be relieved from Gehenom. To help us not go to Gehenom. Why? We make sins. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes not on purpose, sometimes they're big, sometimes they're little. We don't really know the size of everything unless we know it's Din Karet, which is 36 different sins. Or 32 different sins, some say 48. But the point being is, is that we all make sins. And some of these sins, uh, we forgot we made them. So how are we going to do tshuva for them? So Rabbi Akiva says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us the mitzvah of staka simply to help us not go to Gehenom. And this is a reality. This is a reality. It doesn't matter if you're a rabbi or you're a Talmud or you're Jewish or you're not Jewish. Everybody makes mistakes. And one of the best ways to help is to help people. Now again, if you have people struggling in your own house, your parents, your brothers, your kids, that comes first. That comes first. Help your own family first. I'm not talking about help them go on vacation or buy a second house or pay a third mortgage. I'm talking about they don't have food to eat, they have, they're struggling. Also help them first. But if you have more than you need, then try to at least do something about it to help people that don't have even what they need. Why? It helps you. He's gonna, Kadosh Baruch is going to feed them anyway. But sometimes I have to remind you guys of this stuff because, again, this is even what Rabbi Udan Asi did. Rabbi Udan Asi, the Baal Bala, uh, Mishnah, our entire oral Torah is from his writing. He was rich Kekorach, very, very rich, had hundreds of horses, properties, had more money than you could possibly imagine. He, anytime he had a Masit Zedakah, had some type of campaign for something, he would go involve his rich friends. Why? You have all the money to do it yourself. All that's the court, uh, you can do it all by yourself. Why are you involving all your friends? He says, to do them a favor. I can do it myself. But why should I do all the chesed by myself? Why don't I involve my friends, people I care about? So that's the reason. You don't want to give, you don't give. But again, I remind you simply because sometimes people need to be reminded. Now, chesed is done in a lot of different ways. One way is to help people eat. Another way that's even bigger than that is to help people go to Olam Abba. Help them do tshuva. Get them close to Hashem. Eliminate their safik, their doubts that they have in their mind. Many times people have questions and I really don't have time. I don't have time to eat. I don't have time to, to drink. I don't have time to sleep. I don't have time to see my kids. I don't have time for anything, but we try to do whatever we can anyway. Why? Because somebody sends me a question at 3 o'clock in the morning. For them, it's important, especially if it's a serious question. And we answer it. Why? Because I think of it from my own perspective, that if I had a question 
And this question bothered me. And I just couldn't move forward without this question. Perhaps this one question will help this person do complete tshuva. So we try to do whatever we can, whatever mesirut nefesh, whatever sacrifice we can to help people, simply because we need to eliminate the doubts. Many people have doubts in their emunah, whether it's their uh, emunah in uh, they'll make money, uh, emunah that they'll have uh, the, uh, a wife, a husband, children, uh, emunah in the chachamim themselves, all the laws, whether it's rabbinical, whether it's biblical, whether we should care, whether we shouldn't care, whether it's to listen to this rabbi, whether it's to, uh, to marry this woman, and so on and so forth. People have all types of emunah issues, and we simply try to answer the questions, not because they can't find the answer somewhere else. If you go to Google, you can probably find 8 out of 10 questions. 8 out of 10 questions, but I know that uh, most people are too lazy to do that. They're not going to do it. If I tell them, listen, it's on Google, I simply know that they're just not going to look for it. They came to me for a reason. So you have, Kadosh Baruch gave you an opportunity. So it's a very, very big chesed to help people get chizu, get eliminate their, uh, their doubts. Help people do tshuva, because that way you can help them go to Olam Abba, to heaven, and uh, there's no greater gift than that. This is even greater than feeding them. But you can't get them to Olam Abba if they don't eat. They have to survive long enough in this world to do mitzvot in order to go to Olam Abba. So we have to do both. We can't just do only spiritual. We have to do material too, physical. But in addition to that, in addition to that, one of the most dangerous things that we have in the world today is that many of the problems that we have are simply self-inflected. Where the Torah says, Ivelet Adam Tesalef Darko, Ve'al Adonai is Aflibo. The stupidity of man will cause him to sin. And then I'll get mad at Hashem for punishing him. What stupidity? Listening to the wrong people. Getting advice from your friends and not your rabbi. Getting advice from your wife's friends and not from your wife herself. Getting uh, advice from false speakers, whether they be politicians or fake rabbis and so on. And the problem is, Rabotai, is that when we get a bad message, that already creates a bad foundation. Yesterday, our own dear Rabbi Ephraim made a very extensive shiur about five of the Erev Rav that we've spoken against, Manus Friedman, Dweck, uh, Mirvis, uh, Goldberg, and Drol Kasuto, uh, detailing not only their crimes, but also detailing the Da Torah of how it's not only dangerous to listen to these people, it is forbidden. It's forbidden to listen to them and even allow these people inside your house or your Bet Knesset based on the things that they've done and, and, and continue to do and until they do tshuva. Now, there are others on the list that are also horrible, also dangerous, but we specify those simply because they're the ones that are unfortunately causing the most amount of damage. Uh, Goldberg also, Shem uh, Shaim uh, Yerkav. So the, uh, the key is to know that when we go and we publicize the people that are leading people astray, it's not for popularity. Trust me when I tell you, it does not make you any more popular. It gives you just more headaches. It's not for money, because I promise you, it doesn't earn you a single penny. Because even the people that are your fans are generally not big fans of just constantly hearing about this stuff. Because it's, okay, fine, I heard, okay, I don't want to hear it again. Some people even stop listening. Ah, oh, listen, every year you're talking about people, people, okay, why don't you just talk about Torah? Like, they don't think this is Torah. And although it may not necessarily be everybody's favorite cup of tea, it is very much a very big part of the Torah. Because we have in this week's parasha, parashat Shoftim, that Moshe Rabbeinu tells us that in the future there will be prophets. Meaning he's not the only prophet. He's the prophet of all prophets. 
But in the future, there's going to be other prophets. Other Nevi'ah Hashem. Other prophets of Hashem. Other people that speak to Hashem. And Hashem speaks back to them. And not just in their mind, but in reality. The Gemara in Masechet Megillah says that there were 55 prophets that were named in the Torah. But in reality, there were over a million prophets that Am Yisrael has had over history. And the reason why 55 are mentioned by name and not the over a million is because whatever those 55 said, which was 48 men and 7 females, 7 women, holy women and holy men, whatever, whatever uh, they said is relevant to every single generation until Mashiach comes. Whereas the others... The other million plus, their prophecy was relevant to their day. And therefore, there's no point of putting their prophecy in the Torah. What do we learn from that? Every single verse in the Torah is prophecy. Every single verse in the Torah is prophecy. Every single thing that's mentioned in the Torah is from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, whether it's directly spoken to Moshe Rabbeinu, or it's to Ruach HaKodesh, to one of the Nevi'im. But the point being that the Chachamim, that added different parts of the Tanakh to the Chumash, they had other books. They had other things that were considered, but rejected. For example, there was a famous Sefer called Ben Sirah which was the son of Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet is a book of Jeremiah. There's also uh, um, uh, Echa, which is uh, Lamentations in English, both written by Jeremiah. He was Kodesh Kodeshim at the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. And his son, which himself was born out of a miracle, the Midrash says that some Reshaim, wanted to force Jeremiah to sin by wasting seed. And he said, if you don't waste seed, we're going to rape you. I mean, this is bad, this is even worse. And forced him to do so, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because he was anus, he was against his will, took his seed and put it into the, the woman and from, into, uh, and from there his son came. His son came. Some wasn't the woman wasn't there. Shem took that seat, put it in her eye, and Ben Sirah was, 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 was born. This is what the Midrash says. Ben Sirah was born already on day one. They knew he was holy. Why? He was born with a full set of teeth, spoke clearly like an adult, and asked his mother for meat. Give me some meat, I'm hungry. If you ever had kids, this is going to sound a little weird, but that's what happened. Jeremiah himself was also born that way. So he was nonetheless a holy person, and there's a book. But the Chachamim decreed this book, although it has much wisdom in it, similar to Proverbs, will not be part of the Tanakh. Why? They came to a conclusion that it was not 100% divinely inspired. Meaning some came from his wisdom itself, which is good, but not divinely inspired. It's not with Ruach HaKodesh 100%. It does not belong in the Tanakh. And some even say you're not allowed to study it, which makes it very interesting because a lot of people want to study it, especially because they're not allowed to study it. But Rabbi Akiva says you're allowed if you already know everything else and you're Tamit Chacham and so on and so forth, but... The point being is, is that there are other holy books that have existed, but the Chachamim decided not to include them. Because everything that's in the Tanakh is directly from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Like I said, either from Hashem to Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem to the Prophets, Ruach HaKodesh and so on, prophecy or Ruach HaKodesh and so on. But everything is divinely inspired one way or the other. Meaning that every single verse that we have in the Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you and me to read it. Or for the more well-spoken English among us, you and I to read it. Why? Because it's relevant to you. 
It's relevant to you. In the book of Judges, Sefer Shoftim, not Parashat Shoftim that we're on, Sefer Shoftim. Book of Judges, in a chapter 5, verse number 23, we hear something very shocking. Barak, the tzaddik, righteous person, who was a general in the army, just had a miraculous win in a war against Sisera. He won the war already. Won the battle. So the battle is over. When he comes back, he sees someone by the name of Meroz. He sees Meroz. Some say it was a group of people, some say it was a specific person, so on different commentaries say different things, but he sees it nonetheless. In chapter 5, verse number 23, he says, Curse Moroz, said the angel of Hashem. Curse. Cursed are its inhabitants, for they failed to come to aid the nation of Hashem. To aid Hashem against the mighty. Barak, Righteous person gives a curse of a lifetime. With the Gemara in Masechet Shavuot in page 36a, Ula says that when Barak cursed Meroz, he didn't just say it like I did, with a little bit of an intimidating voice. He did a little more. What did he do? 400 shofarot. 400 horns. Two! 400. And then, curse Meroz. Curse, curse. Such a horrible curse. For what? You did not come to help us in the war of Hashem. When you could. Yeah, but Barak, you won the war anyway. When you UK didn't come. You won. It's over. Like, what difference does it make? You got all the kavod. You get all the kavod now, you get all the respect now, you get the honor, you get the money, you get everything. Who cares? It's good he didn't come, because now everything's for you. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It's not about the outcome. Outcome was in the hands of Hashem. But you actively chose not to join a fight for the sake of Hashem. And for that, Barak says, you are cursed. And the Gemara says, anybody, anybody that sees that there's a fight for the sake of Hashem, you're fighting against Reshaim, you're fighting against Kofrim, you're fighting against people that are desecrating Hashem's name, and you don't join it. Not that you are just, uh, no, no, you don't join the fight. The Gemara says, cursed is such a person. Cursed is such a person. Why? You had the ability to fight for the sake of Hashem and you didn't do it? You're a speaker. People listen to you. You know about the problem. You agree with the problem. But you chose to stay quiet. Why? Ah, you know, I don't like to get involved in machloket. What machloket? What machloket? The guy is a rasha and he's causing people to sin. That's not a machloket. A machloket is usually when both sides are right. But when one guy says that our avot kedushim, our holy sages, our holy patriarchs have mental uh, uh, problems, or that there's no schar ve'ones, there's no uh, reward and punishment, or that the shulchan aruch needs to change, or that you should do drugs because he decides that it's allowed, and so on and so forth. You know everything is, he's doing or she's doing is wrong. It's causing people to go astray. But you're going to stay quiet, Tatale. You're going to stay quiet. Why? Because you don't want machloket. You don't want the negative attention. You want to teach something else? Barak says, you're cursed. What Barak? 
הקדוש ברוך הוא עושה זה. אז הקדוש ברוך הוא פותס פסוק יהיה. מה ברק? ברק הוא הניסד איש אלי נו איזכנא בינה תורה. הוא הניסד איש אלי נו איזכנא בינה תנ״ך. אבל הקדוש ברוך הוא made sure that we know about this over 2,000 years later. 3,000 years later. Why? Because he wants us to know it's not that Hashem needs us to fight for him like some fools think and try to justify their lethargy when it comes for fighting for Hashem. He doesn't need you. Hashem's honor will increase with or without you. But you chose not to. You chose not to support it. You chose to stay quiet. Some are even foolish enough to go against it. Listen, Rabbi, I agree with what you're saying, but why do you have to say it? Why don't you just keep it quiet like everybody else? That's going against it. I'm not talking about the people that actually go against it and, and tell you, you know, that you're bad for doing it. They agree with the Reshaim. They agree with it. No, I'm not talking about those people. Obviously, it's a given. I'm talking about the people that simply try to cool you off. Try to cool you off. Listen, you've already said about this Manus and this Goldberg and this guy. Now, how many times are you going to say it? Enough. No, it's, uh, it's ruining the shoe. I'm not going to watch you anymore. That type of person. That's going against it. Such a person makes a statement like that, Barak has something to say to you. Why? Not only you didn't join the fight, but you're trying to slow the ones that are. It's already a mistake. It's already a mistake that you didn't jump on the bandwagon with all of your weapons and try to do whatever you can to fight for the honor of Hashem, but on top of that, you're trying to slow up the ones that are doing it? What a mistake. A mistake that's very expensive. One verse, three curses. Why? It's not that Hashem needs you to fight for Him. It's that you chose not to. So then when a person goes up to Shemaim, they're going to ask him at the Bed Din, what did you do in your life? Oh, I worked, I was on Wall Street, I got married, I got a few kids. No, okay, we know that. What did you do? What did you do with your time, your attention, your energy, your strength? What did you do with it? I just said, well, no, 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 no. What did you fight for? What did you fight for? Let's see. We'll show you. Look, see, you started this company as a janitor. You ended up the CEO. How did that happen? Oh, you pretty much killed everybody in your way. You outperformed everyone. You outworked everyone. You started at 5 o'clock in the morning. You finished at uh, 10 o'clock at night. You created all types of ideas. You were very ambitious. You fought for your job. Yeah, yeah, it's good. We'll see. What else did you fight? What? Oh, look at that. Your wife. Look, she said no 87 times before she said yes to you. But you kept coming back. Like spam mail. You kept coming back. No matter how many times you pressed blood, kept coming back. Uh, look, you got her. That's good, right? We'll see. We'll see. You fought for the wife. Let's see. We'll see. What else you fought? Oh, look at that. You fought against your neighbor because he was building an extension to his house and it was going to block your view. So you sent letters to the government to tell on him. To tell on him, look, he's going to block my, uh, my window. He's going to block my this. You said 89 letters. 89 letters. And in the end, you know what? The government not only didn't let him do the extension, they gave him a fine for $10,000. That's good? We'll see. We'll see. And they keep calculating all your fights. Oh, one guy sat in your chair in a shul. He sat in your chair in your shul, and you made sure that he never sat in your shul. In fact, you made sure he never came back again from the embarrassment you caused him. You caused him. That's good? We'll see. And they're going to show you all the fights. All the fights you fought for your whole life. You fought for the chair, you fought for the parking spot, you fought for the job, you fought for the contract, you fought for the woman, you fought for the man, you fought for your friend, you fought for this. When did you fight for a shen? Well, I, I don't think I ever did. Did you ever have an opportunity? Well, you know what, before you had, let's show you. Oh, you saw that shield? You saw, you agreed with it? That's all, oh, the shayim, you saw the proofs? You still stay quiet. You didn't support. Actually, in fact, you fought against the people that are fighting by telling them not to fight. Because everyone should be 
united. The Rashaim and the Tzadikim together. Everyone should be united. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to show a person the things that they fought for. Then he's going to ask him, how come you didn't fight for me? I didn't need you to fight for me, but how come you didn't? Am I less than your wife? Am I less than your customer? Am I less than your boss? Am I less than the parking spot? Am I less than the view? Am I less than all of these things you fought for your whole life? Am I less? Who'd you pray for when you needed Refua Shlema? Who'd you pray for when you needed Parnasa? Who'd you pray to? Pray to me. So how come I'm less everywhere else except when you need something? This is why Abu Tayyip Karim, the Gemara says, fighting for Akadosh Baruch Hu is not a suggestion. It's an obligation. And will also be one of the signs of Mashiach. Where the Rambam writes in Ilchot Melachim, the different signs of Mashiach, one of the most critical ones, where he's not saying he could meet some of these categories. If he misses one of them, he's not Mashiach for sure. And even if he meets all of the categories, he's only a possibility. And we're only going to know for sure if he builds the Bet HaMikdash. One of them is to make peace. Not peace with the Rishayim and the Tzadikim. No more Rishayim. Worldwide Kiruv. Whoever is a Rasha, doesn't do Tshuva, finished. Gone. No more time. They go to a place that's a little hotter than Florida. All the idol worshippers, all the heretics, all the homosexuals, all the transsexuals, all the people that desecrate Hashem's name, with the keeper, without a keeper. All of them, gone. Why? The Rambam writes, one of the things we know about the end of times, he writes, in Chot Melachim, in chapter 12, Alakha number 4, that we're going to have, I'm sorry, chapter... 12, yeah, chapter 12, Alakha number 2. That there will be Milchemet Gogu Magog. The, word, the words will imply that the war of Gogu Magog will take place at the beginning of the Messianic age. Before the war of Gogu Magog, the Prophet will arise to inspire Israel to become upright, do tshuva, and prepare their hearts. As Malachi said, in chapter 3, verse 22, Behold, I am sending you Eliyahu Navi. Now this Mashiach, what is he going to do? One of the most critical parts, fight the wars of Hashem. He doesn't fight the wars of Hashem, it's not Mashiach. Maybe very righteous, maybe very smart, good guy. Not, not, not Mashiach, for sure. And needless to say, he has to be the descendant of David Melech and so on and so forth. But the point being is, fighting the wars of Hashem is not only a suggestion, obligation for someone as great as even as the Mashiach. And not just for the Mashiach, for everybody. Because if you're not fighting for Hashem, but you're fighting for jobs, you're fighting for money, you're fighting for, to get married, you're fighting for medicine, you're fighting with the uh, conspiracy theories, you're fighting with your neighbor, you're fighting with your kids, you're fighting with everything. You fought somebody because they cut you in line for the supermarket, so you're number two instead of number three. You fought everybody, but you're not fighting the wars of Hashem. Barak says, no good. No good. You had an opportunity. In fight. This, Rabotai, is a very, very important thing. Why? Not because we want to fight constantly. Because it shows simply who loves Hashem and who doesn't. Who only fight for their own honor, their own pocket, their own reputation, their own agenda, and who fights for Hashem. 
Because you know that if somebody crossed you, made fun of you, you'd fight for it. You'd say something. Ten times a day, people send me a message. Such and such person made fun of me. What should I do? Such and such person is saying Lashon Ara about me. What should I do? Such and such person wrote this about me. What should I do? You ask the same question about such and such person said something against Hashem? What should you do? How come you don't? How come it's only what you should do about you? But your reputation? But your job? Your pocket? How come? Your kavod? How come not kavod kvot shamayim? How come not the honor of heaven? How come? It's a problem. We don't fight for heaven. Why? We fight for ourselves. And the Navi here says, we have to change. Because when we don't fight for Kvot Shemaim, bad things happen. Rav Wasserman, Allah wa Shalom, has told us that before the Holocaust, we had many Chachamim. Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, Chafetz Chaim, Rav Wasserman, and countless others predict the Holocaust like prophets. Rav Wasserman outright said that when Geiger, the head of the reform movement, Shem Rashaim Yerkav, when they made it a law within the reform movement that intermarriage is now allowed, it's a mitzvah in their eyes. Hence the reason why their rabbis are not even Jewish today. He said when they changed the Shulchan Aruch, they change history. So much so, the Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, almost a hundred years before the Holocaust says, there will come a day where the Goim will write their own Shulchan Aruch. And in their Shulchan Aruch, they're going to say that Jews are not allowed to marry Goim. Opposite of the reform. Meaning that the Goim will agree with our Shulchan Aruch, with the Tzadikim, with the people that believe in Hashem, with the people that follow the Torah. But the Goim are going to say it, not the reform, not the heretics. And he says, Oy lanu, woe to us on such a day when we have to learn Torah from such a Shulchan Aruch. Why? Because when the Goim are going to teach you Torah, that means it's Yad Hashem, it's the hand of Hashem, and it's going to hurt. And that's exactly what happened. The Nuremberg Laws, passed 90 years later, said any Jew that marries a German, death penalty. Death penalty. The Chafetz Chaim, almost 100 years old, was crying and telling people, I see black clouds over Europe. The streets will be full of blood if people don't do tshuva. He begged people, please take me house to house so, so I could talk to people, help them do tshuva. 100 years old. Why? He saw. How long was this? was nine years before the Holocaust. He already told all of his Talmudim, Rav Wasserman included. On Rosh Hashanah, he says, see black clouds, bad things are going to happen. People don't do tshuva. Meaning that when we don't fight, against the Reshaim, against the evil, whether that evil has a kippah or it doesn't, then Hashem has to fight for his own honor. But when he fights for his own honor, unfortunately, there's a lot of collateral damage. And that's why we learn, Chachamim teaches from the prophet Pinchas, who became Eliyahu Navi, Zahul Letov, Pinchas is Eliyahu, that people that fight the wars of Hashem they bring mercy to the world. Even though they bring havoc, because now you pretend like there's peace because everybody's politically correct. You only talk behind each other's back, not to each other's face. And then one guy calls you out. Hey, you're saying this. You're that. It calls reshaim a reshaim. Calls it out. Brings out the dirt in public. No one likes that. He says, but that one that actually fights the wars of Hashem that makes everybody uncomfortable, but nonetheless, some people do tshuva as a result. That actually brings mercy from Shemaim. Why? Because at least somebody's fighting for Shem. In the case of Pinchas, 
it was such a big fight that he was willing to put his life on a line where he went into it knowing he's going to die. Not thinking he's going to die. Knowing he's going to die. And therefore he lived forever. That was the Midah Kineged Midah. The measure for measure that Pinchas got, he went into it to go kill the head of the Shimon tribe knowing he's going to die. Imagine you go inside the White House and you kill the president. You know you're going to die. They're going to kill you. They're not going to put you in jail. They're going to kill you. Pinchas did that. Pinchas went to the head of the Shimon tribe, knowing he's going to die. Why? Fight the war of Hashem. What was the reward? The Mishnah in Avot says he got ten miracles. Ten different miracles. One of them was that his own neshama left his body from fear. Hashem put it back. On top of it, he gave him extraordinary strength. And needless to say, he gave him permanent life. Never going to die. Pinchas is Eliyahu Navi. Why? You fought the war of Hashem. Knowing you're going to die. The reward for that is you're going to live forever. So, Rav Wasserman has taught us over these last few months that at the time before Mashiach, there will be many people led astray not just by society, not just by the Yetzirah that's typical in every generation, not just by ignorance which is rampant, not just by secularism which is continuing to increase by the day, not just by all types of filthy desires and addictions, but also they will fall because of false leaders, false political leaders, false rabbinical leaders, religious leaders, false beliefs, period, false religions. And he says that we learn from the prophet Yechizkel that these false leaders, he calls them shepherds, these are the number one reason, more than anything else, that is causing Am Yisrael not to do tshuva. More than secularism, more than liberalism, more than desires, more than money, more than everything else. He says these leaders, these false leaders, are the number one reason why Am Yisrael has not done tshuva. So therefore, he spent more on this particular topic than anything else in this book. Week after week, we discuss the same thing in a different facet. It's the same diamond, just another facet of it, another look at it, another part of it, another shade. Every week, it's the same thing. False leaders, false leaders, false leaders. It's not that we don't have anything else to say. It's that this is what he's talking about time and time again. It never ends. That's how bad it is. Rav Wasserman was a gdola do. He could have written anything and everything. But he wrote this because this was the most important. Not for his generation. For us. As he already himself said, that he believed that his actions and the righteous people's actions may save the Anglo-Saxon Jews in America and England as they were taking him to be murdered in cold blood, these Nazis, Yimach Shimon Vezichan. So now after he tells us last week that when we do not serve Hashem 100%, And we want to be goyim. We want to have goyim haircuts. Goyim hobbies. Goyim books. Goyim mentality. Which are fine for the goyim. You're allowed to eat bacon, egg, and cheese if you're goyim. No problem. Enjoy it. La Briut. Have two. 
No problem. You can eat pig. Doesn't affect you. Look at you. Doesn't affect you at all. It's not healthy. But who am I to speak about health? You want to eat bats, cats, rats, as long as they're dead, enjoy it. You're going. No problem. Drive on Shabbat? You should. If I was a girl, I'd drive on Shabbat. Why not? You don't have to keep Shabbat. You're forbidden from keeping Shabbat. It's a present for the Jews. You want to get married to a new wife every few years? Have a good time. You can have a tough life. You're going to be pretty lonely and miserable. You want to do it? Go ahead. But if you're a Jew, these things are not your options. These and many things. If a guy wants to read Catcher of the Rye, some book full of filth, not a good idea, but you want to do it? Go ahead, break your head. A Jew wants to read it because Dwick suggested in his book club it's forbidden. It's forbidden. It's forbidden for a Jew to read such a book. It's called Chitzonim. There are books that are called Chitzonim, meaning outside, outsiders. Not a lot for Jews. It's full of immorality, immodesty, and needless to say, it's secularism. So why, I can't read any secular books, Rabbi? Only after you finish the entire Shaz about a hundred times. That may be. We'll think about it. And the Shulchan Aruch, another hundred times. And the Chumash, and the Tanakh, and all the Poskim. And pretty much every Jewish book that exists. After that, maybe. Maybe we'll find in a tale. Why? You haven't fulfilled your obligation. You want to go read something else? But if you're a non-Jew, go enjoy it. Go read Catcher of the Rye, Stephen King, uh, get scared, read about vampires, magicians. Go ahead, do it. But if you're a Jew, can't do it. Why? You have a different responsibility. Different responsibility. Now, the problem is that many times it's even mentioned in the Torah Several times. In this week's parasha, parasha Shoftim, chapter 17, verse 14. In Sefer Shmuel, chapter 8, verse 8. In Sefer Shmuel, chapter 8, verse 20. In other places. Dram Yisrael makes the mistake of wanting to be like the Goyim. Where in this week's parasha, anyone who doesn't notice, somehow the parasha always connects to everything. Yishtabach Shimo. Am Yisrael says that we want a king. It's not enough for us to have the king of the kings. We want a king of flesh and blood. Where it says, when you come to the land that Hashem, your God, gives you and possess it and settle in it, and you will say, I will set a king over myself like all the nations that are around me. Asima alay melech ki kol agoyim. Asher zvivotai. You're going to want a king of flesh and blood. Why? Because the Goyim have it. They have presidents. They have prime ministers. They have kings. We want one. Why? It's not enough to have a shem. Not enough. You want something else? Yeah, we want to be like the Goyim. We want someone we can talk to. We made this mistake many times. Sefer Shmuel says the same thing. We constantly want to be like the Goyim. And the shem is merciful on his people and he knows that we're going to make this mistake but still needless to say although he has mercy we still have to pay for our mistakes well we got kings but many of them were gashayim we got leaders but many of them most of them were wicked people horrible people tortured the people so our own request of being like the Goyim has constantly led us astray, has constantly led us to our own failures, has constantly led us to our own suffering. And yet we still go back to Hashem complain. Fulfilling the verse, Adam Adam Tasalif Darko, Adonai is Aflibo. 
the stupidity of man will cause him to sin, and then he gets mad at Hashem for punishing him. So, Rav Wasserman has told us that when we don't glue ourselves to Hashem, what happens? Then we will become a people that's in the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and his associates. Who is Nebuchadnezzar? Hitler. Only a Jewish version. As the Midrash says, and also the Chida writes, and several other Chachamim, Nebuchadnezzar was either the son or the grandson of Shlomo Melech, which he had with the Queen Shva, which was a wicked queen, a wicked woman, full of Tum'ah. And Shlomo Melech wanted to marry her because he wanted to bring Mashiach by destroying the Tum'ah of the world. And that was a mistake that he made. But nonetheless, from that mistake, we had to pay. What do we pay? Nebuchadnezzar was born, lived for 400 years, possibly more, and destroyed the first Bet HaMikdash that his grandfather or his father built. Depending on which Midrash you go with. His own father, his own grandfather built the Bet HaMikdash, he destroyed it. But that's also the reason why Nebuchadnezzar did not kill Jeremiah. It wasn't because they were friends when they were growing up. But the Chamim say in the Midrash and a few other places that when Jeremiah and Nebuchadnezzar were both young, Jeremiah was already a prophet. And he saw that this little nothing, loser, homeless guy, it was his friend, Nebuchadnezzar. He says, if Hashem ever gives me, he believed in Hashem. If Hashem gives me power, first thing I'm going to do is destroy the Bet Midash. First thing. And Jeremiah didn't tell him, but he saw that at that moment, at that moment, it was Sha'at Ratzon. It was the moment of accepting Nebuchadnezzar's prayers. Meaning that Hashem was going to give him this. So he started pleading with him. No, no, at least don't destroy this. No, no, I'm going to destroy it. At least don't kill the tzaddikim. No, I'm going to kill them. At least don't do this. No, I'm going to kill this. Much vicious. But he was a nothing. He was homeless. Nothing. Poor guy. But, and later on he did. And Jeremiah saw with his own eyes. But Nebuchadnezzar told his head general, Nebuchadnezzar, make sure to be very careful not to touch or harm Jeremiah. He can do whatever he wants. Why? What's it? Why? Because they were friends when they were kids. Many people are friends when they're kids and kill each other. Why? He had a special connection with them. What's the connection? The Arizal says, Jeremiah was the Gilgul of Shlomo Melech. Jeremiah was the reincarnation of Shlomo Melech. Meaning, it's his father or it's his grandfather. So now, Rabotai, this Nebuchadnezzar murdered in cold blood millions and millions of Jews, rivers of blood, destroyed the Bet Migdash, caused an enormous amount of harm. The Hitler of his day, or actually much worse, was a disgusting homosexual where he would he was in control of the whole world, so he would order all of the other kings to come to his kingdom so he could rape them. Just a filthy human being. The Tuma of Tuma. But Hashem promised him that he'll be the strongest king to live until Mashiach. No one has had as much control of the world as Nebuchadnezzar. Why? At the moment of truth, he gave Hashem kavod. One time at the time of Cheskiah, he was still a scribe in the He was a nothing. He was a nobody. He worked for the king. And the king wanted to write a letter to Cheskiah saying, 
to the king Chizkiyahu, hello, because there was a big famous miracle made. Hashem turned back time for the sake of Chizkiyahu. He took the sun and put it back down, literally reversing time, but in open daylight. A day lasted 36 hours, and everyone knew it was in the merit of Chizkiyahu as a miracle that happened to him, that Hashem, in essence, gave him health. He was about to die. So this king, this Goy king from, from Babel, from Babylon, wrote a letter in honoring Chizkiyahu. Chizkiyahu, hello, the people of uh, Yerushalayim, hello, and your God, hello. So the Muchanet said, the scribe, said, you believe in their God? To the to his king. So of course I believe in their God. Look what he did, he just took the sun and <whistles> put it back. He says, how come you put him last? In the letter. How can you put him last in the letter? If he's really a God, then... Why did you put him last in the letter? So I'm out to the king of kings. The king said, you're right, go get the guy, go get the delivery man. So, Nebuchadnezzar ran after the delivery man, stepped three steps outside of the door, and got the guy. Why only three steps? The malachim got involved. They stopped him. He said, if he takes one more step, he's going to destroy all of Am Yisrael. If he steps one more step for the sake of the honor of Hashem, Hashem will give him the right, the permission, to destroy Am Yisrael. Three steps, which is the reason, by the way, why when we do Amidah, we take three steps back, trying to undo what Nebuchadnezzar did. So he got, he became the king. Nebuchadnezzar became the king as a result of this. He got the right to destroy the Bet HaMikdash. And to become the most powerful king to live until Mashiach comes. Not Nazi. There's nothing next to this guy. Why? Kvod Hashem. He gave Hashem Kavod. The Nazis, many of them, some of them were Christians and some of them were atheists. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't an atheist. So Hashem tells us that we, 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 we want to be like Nebuchadnezzar. What's the punishment? He'll put us in Nebuchadnezzar's hands. And then he continues, and he says, nowadays, the Jewish people have chosen two idols to which they offer up their sacrifices. They are socialism and nationalism. The new gospel of nationalism can be defined very briefly as, let us be like the nations. All that is required of the Jew is a national feeling. He who pays the shekel and sings the Hatikva, which is the Zionistic song for Eretz Yisrael, is thereby exempted from all of the laws of the Torah according to them. And it's clear that this idea is considered to be fundamentally idol worship from the point of view of the Torah. These two forms of idol worship have poisoned the minds and the hearts of the Hebrew youth. Each one has its tribe of false prophets in the shape of writers and speakers who do their work to perfection. So he says, in his time, you had the Enlightenment movement, Zionism, Socialism, communism, nationalism, all these isms. All feminism stemmed from it. All things that are anti-God. Anti-God. Woman comes, she says, you know, I'm a feminist. Oh, so you're anti-God. No, 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 I'm just a feminist. You're anti-God. Why? Because God is not a feminist. God's not feminist. God loves his daughters, he loves his sons. Each one has a role in the world. You think you deserve something because of your color, your gender, your this, your that. It's anti-God. It's an anti-God belief. Where does it start from? Let us be like the nations. You want to be like the Goyim. Why? Because the Goyim 
They have all these in interesting things. A guy by the name of Karl Marx, Shem Reshaim Yerkav, was a Jew by birth, but a Goy, according to his living standards, to the highest extent. After his work, and then later on, by his follower, Lenin, Shem Reshaim Yerkav, Socialism, communism, all of these isms prospered where socialism in essence is a belief in, briefly, social ownership in order to cease capitalism and fundamentally a secular movement. The vast majority of them are atheists that believe that everything should be shared. And there should not be profit as a motive, unless it's to their pocket. Because interestingly enough, all of these socialist leaders were very rich. And very profitable from their socialistic activity. But everybody else, not allowed to profit. Capitalism? No, that's bad. You have a good product that you can make a lot of money on? No, 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 you should give it free. Why should I give it free? I worked hard for it. What did you watch? It took you two months to make it. Why should you make a billion dollars for something that took you two months? Because it didn't take me two months. It took me two months to implement this particular idea, but it took me 20 years of education. Yeah, but people need it. Yeah, that's the point. Why shouldn't I make a profit out of this? Why am I not allowed to make a profit? There are certain people in the world today that are causing havoc all over the United States, destroying public property. They go to a pharmacy that they're probably going to need at some point and decide to burn the place. They go to police station, police cars, which they're probably going to need one day, and decide to destroy it. They go to a local supermarket, steal all their stuff, and then destroy it. Why? We don't believe in capitalism. We don't believe in a profit. We don't believe we're, it's not fair that they have more than us. These types of ideas are anti-God. Every single person has a role in the world. Every single person is decreed to either be rich or poor. Every year on Rosh Hashanah, according to our Gemara, Maseret Rosh Hashanah, page 16a, and Maseret Beitzah, page 16b. Every year on Rosh Hashanah, until Rosh Hashanah, Kadosh Baruch Hu decides how much money you're going to make. You destroying stores is not going to help your social status. You complaining about being broke is not going to help your social status. You sitting at home doing nothing, not going to help you either. You thinking that if they have less, you'll have more, not going to help you. But unfortunately, Rabotai, we have an entire generation of losers, degenerates, lazy people, that simply believe that they should get stuff just because they exist. I was born, therefore I deserve. This is an anti-God mentality. You don't deserve jack. In fact, the fact that you're alive is a miracle. Every second that you're alive, it's only because of the kindness of Hashem. Because if a regular human being was God, you'd be dead a long time ago. To think that you deserve just because you showed up. To think that you deserve because you tried hard. To think that you deserve because of your gender. To think that you deserve because you were born with a certain amount of uh, chemicals in your body that make you black, green, or yellow, or burgundy. To think that you deserve because your eyes are a certain shade. To think that you deserve because you're a certain religion. To think that you deserve for any reason whatsoever is an anti-God mentality. 
you do not deserve anything. And everything you get is simply a gift from a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Yeah, but I worked hard for it. So, you know how many people I know that worked hard and still broke? A lot of people work really hard, harder than you. Broke. So what? You work hard. Yeah, but I showed up. So what? Every day there's hundreds of people showing up to every Home Depot, every uh, uh, truck uh, rental company, waiting for somebody to rent the truck so they give them a work for the day. You want employees go to one of these huge parking lots with a truck? You'll have three, four, five, six hundred people running at your car. Why? They won't work every day. Not because of coronavirus. It's always been the case. And what do you think? These people work uh, light? Hard labor. I've hired them a bunch of times. Tough to deal with, but nonetheless they work. Harder than you, what do you work? On a cubicle? What, you press buttons on a computer? What do you do? No, 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 I want air conditioning. Okay, so you're air conditioning. So what? Everybody works hard. You don't deserve it because you work hard. Yeah, but how come he has? Because God decided he has. Because God decided. Yeah, but he doesn't even keep Shabbat. Exactly. Exactly. God decided to give him a lot of reward in this world in order to destroy him. You want to be like him? You want Hashem to want to destroy you? Call you an enemy? You see a rich person that lives a life against God? You should cry for him. Cry for him. Hamash. Tears. Crocodile tears. Why? Hashem is trying to destroy him. You want Hashem, the king of kings, to destroy you? What are you jealous of? Why do you think you're entitled? Why do you think you deserve anything? Because I tried. So what you tried? Every successful person is not successful because he tried. He's successful because he overcame failure. He tried again. And again. And again. And again. And eventually the blessing came. And it's not because he tried many times. It's simply Hashem wanted him to be, succeed at some point. Did he give success? You think that you deserve something that doesn't belong to you? You're going to take some of his money because he has extra? Without him wanting to give you the money? Without having permission? You're going to go destroy his stuff? Because you don't have it? That's anti-God. And unfortunately, Rabotai, this type of false belief has been around for a long time. There are even people running for office right now in the United States that have this, these beliefs, these socialistic beliefs. There are many people in government right now that have these types of beliefs. And this type of anti-God mentality is also one of the strongest secular movements. Because a good majority of them are also atheist. Meaning they have a religion. It's called atheism. Atheist people are very religious people. Don't let the name fool you. They are very zealous about their belief that they are their own God. In fact, if we were as zealous as the atheist people, it's very possible the Mashiach would have already arrived. What's my proof? Look at this room. Look at all the other rooms that I've given lectures in. I've met thousands upon thousands of Jews. Thousands. And non-Jews. Tens of thousands. How many, how many of those people go out of their way to go tell complete strangers about their beliefs? Go see a guy at a store talking to another guy about God. And tell him, hey, you believe in God? No, I don't believe in God. Okay, let me tell you about God. How many people do that? How many? Few. Few do that. Few are zealous enough to go talk to people about God. Few are zealous enough to go share Torah material. Few are strong enough to go do it. Few. Some do, Baruch Hashem. But some don't. 
Atheists, on the other hand, almost every single one of them is a speaker. Almost every single one of them has to share his opinion about that simply he doesn't believe in God. Almost every single one of them. Either in writing or speaking or some other format. Almost every single one of them cannot sit in the same room as anybody else that's preaching God's name. Cannot. Without saying a word. Cannot. Cannot coexist. In fact, they go out of their way to go to different rabbis and priests, Le'avdil, and all types of religious figures, websites and YouTube pages and forums just to tell people about their atheistic beliefs. Like, you don't see us, religious people, go to an atheistic forum telling them, hey, by the way, guys, you should believe in God. You don't see us do that. Why? It's a complete waste of time. It's just waste. Not ways that you can't get them to do tshuva. Is that there's just too many other people that are already interested, that you need to help. That are easy customers. Why go fight with a bunch of difficult customers? You have millions of easy customers. Why go fight with a bunch that maybe 1%, 2% of them will bite? Why? For what? It's a waste of time. It's not good business. So you don't see any religious figures go into atheistic forums and preach a Kadosh Baruch Hu. You're not going to see that. You may see people talk about it in lectures generally to the public, but that's usually to a religious people. But yet, the atheists, they do just that. They go out of their way, watch our lectures, go to our pages, go to our websites, go to, the, sometimes even come to lectures. Especially when there's big events. For what? To wait for the opportunity to preach their false beliefs. If we were as zealous as them, I believe the Mashiach would have already come. And every one of them is that way. Some more fiery than others. But nonetheless, every one of them is zealous about their false beliefs. Zealous. We need to learn even from that. The other idolatry is nationalism. What's nationalism? False unity. Kumbaya. Everybody, we should be friends. Yeah, but he's anti-God. Yeah, you should be friends with him. You should love him. Yeah, but he wants to kill me. Yeah, you should give him a hug. Maybe I'll stop yeah, but he's an enemy of the Torah. Yeah, but anyway, he's still a Jew. Yeah, but he's really a he, and, but he's acting like a she. Yeah, yeah, you should love him, welcome him. Because Mirvis wrote a book all about that, that you should love everybody, even the ones that are anti-God, even the ones that are homosexual, even the ones that are LGBT and ABC and all types of Ds. You wrote a book about it. Go, Mirvis. That's nationalism. Nationalism is everybody together. From there came Zionism. The whole Zionistic idea is a combination of the atheistic mentality, the socialistic mentality, and the nationalistic mentality. For sole purpose of let us be like the other nations. And that's why Rav Wasserman says, anyone who simply gives a dollar, gives a shekel, and sings their song, the Atikva song, that's it, he doesn't have to fulfill the Torah. And that's why, this too, for anyone who knows a little bit about the real history, the real history of what happened post-World War II, 1948, when modern-day Israel was in essence given a permission to exist and led by many Zionists, Ben-Gurion among them and so on, 
anyone that knows the real story of what actually transpired during that time where many Jews from around the world that were religious lovers of Hashem were completely ignorant of the danger of the Zionist. Some of them were even Talmidei Chachamim that supported the Zionists because they didn't realize how evil they are. They didn't realize that their main mission was to destroy the Torah. In fact, the whole song of Atikva, many believe that when they're talking about being a free nation, they're not talking about being a free nation from among the nations. They're talking about being a free nation from the Torah. You no longer have to believe in the Torah. You no longer have to follow the Torah. Many people that were living in practically third world countries like Yemen, Morocco, and others believed that when modern day Israel was born, some of them believed it was like the Mashiach came. So when they arrived and they were put into all of these different barracks and camps, they didn't know what hit them. But they were happy to be there. But not for long. Unfortunately, many of the women that were pregnant with kids when they would deliver the babies, these evil Zionist Nazis, you should call them, not Zionists. Because Zion is from, worked from a Torah, Zion. They're the farthest thing from representing the Torah. Farthest thing from representing Yerushalayim. But these Zionist Nazis, what did they do? They took the Yemenite kids. They took the Moroccan kids. Some of them, they killed them. Some of them, they sold them to different families in America that didn't have kids or different scientists that wanted to do experiments on humans, but they couldn't do it because the law in America forbid it. And what with the parents? Parents came, had a kid. The mom asked, oh, can I see my baby? Oh, no, he died. What do you mean he died? I just saw him, he was just born. He was perfectly healthy. No, no, he died. He died. Sorry, lady. Okay, you go home now. What do you mean? Can I see? Can I see the baby? Can I see it? Can I see the body? No, no, we already took him. He's already left. Left the building. They went and buried him. He's gone. What do you think? It's one story, two stories. Over a thousand stories, still to this day, being hidden by the government. Many of them are being unfolded in the last 15 or 20 years, where many of those kids that were stolen, act, that actually ended up living, but they were sold to American families. Later on, they realize, okay, I'm dark, Yemenite, and my parents are Ashkenazi, white. Obviously, you're not my parents. Who are you? We adopted you. From where? There's some of these kids, they grow up, they're older men, older women already, they start investigating. Where do I come from? They found out that their family's still alive and now that it's Israel, many of them connected. It's me. They see the picture, they see it. Yeah, it's me. DNA, everything. That's my brother. That's my sister. But many of them died. Many of them were killed. Many of them had all types of horrible things. They would take these kids that had long, beautiful peyote representing their Judaism and forced them to cut them. Why? Mashiach is here, they tell them. These Zionist Nazis. Tell them, Mashiach is here. There's no, you don't need to do the Torah anymore. You can eat anything. Come, come, we'll feed you something. They'd feed them pig. They'd feed them bacon, egg, and cheese. They'd feed them everything that you could possibly do against the Torah. Why? Their goal was to destroy the Torah. But Am Yisrael continued to fight these people. Fight them tooth and nail in clever ways. But you couldn't fight them with guns and knives. They were strong. They had control. But you had to fight them with their own tools. The book about the, uh, the bio of one of the Gdolim 
in the Torah world over the last hundred years where you live in a time that uh, you see that people are literally anti-Torah and literally doing everything and anything to go against the Torah you have to not only be strong spiritually strong mentally but you have to also know what to do how to deal with these people in the bio of uh, Rav uh, Yaakov Galinsky Allah Shalom he tells a story where if it wasn't told by a tzaddik and by other tzaddikim though around them it's impossible to believe when you see how he looked physically Rav Galinsky was tiny literally tiny when he would give lectures he was like a lion but he stand on top of the table that's how small he was but he was a powerhouse when it came to Torah so the Zionists would hide the Jewish children in their camps and places and when the religious people would say listen there's many people that just came from Yemen many people just came from Morocco many people that came from different places they want to come to yeshiva why don't you let us take them to go to yeshiva give them freedom no 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 in our camps there's nobody there's nobody wants to go to yeshiva everyone here is not interested in yeshiva so Rav Galinsky and a few others would go and break into these camps and find the kids get their names and a report oh look here I have another name this kid comes from a religious family wants to go to yeshiva give him an offer or sometimes they take them themselves they sneak him out break in one time they caught Rav Kalinsky and said that's it this is your last day we're gonna kill you so he put him in one of these places he's like oh you're gonna meet our leader here in a few moments and then we're gonna take care of you based on what he says but for sure after all the damage you caused us you teach Torah that's against the interest of the nation like a Nazi but they were born Jewish so Rav Galinsky is not even sweating it sitting there praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. their leader comes in big strong respectable looking soldier looks at him Rav Galinsky looks at him recognizes him and they start talking in Yiddish he says to him what should I do he said, how do I know you he says you remember when we were in Siberia in jail over there yeah I'm the guy I begged you one day to give me a soup because we haven't eaten in a few days and the one soup that they gave me was enough I was gonna die and I begged you for soup and he said no in the beginning why I need to live also so please I'm gonna die he said okay here. you gave me your soup and I live because of you but now I'm here I'm working for these people what should I do rabbi what should I do Rav Galinsky says to him tell everybody this guy he is the leader of all the religious people very dangerous person I need to show every one of the camps every one of the sections I would need to show him it's their face so I could discourage them that he's gone now that's it stop being religious I'll take care of me you guys can go okay rabbi all in Yiddish these other guys didn't speak Yiddish so they think that he's gonna take care of Rav Galinsky in the meantime the few other uh, tzaddikim that were Rav Galinsky they didn't get caught they ran to the Chafetz Chaim I said, Kvodarav, we need your prayers. What happened? He said, they caught one of us. Who did they caught? Yankale. Ah, Yankale got them then. Baruch Hashem. No, 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 Rabbi. They caught, they caught him. They, they, the designers caught him. He said, who did they catch? They caught Yankale Galinsky. He goes, ah, Baruch Hashem. Yankale got them. 
Yaakov got them. They don't realize they caught the lion. He's the lion. This little guy, lion, he got them. So anyway, Rav Galinsky is there, and he shows them each camp. Two, 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 two. In every camp, he takes the names. What's your name, son? Okay, name, name, name. Which family? Which this? Which that? After that, he frees them. He runs out of there. Goes to the government. Sit here. Look, I have names and numbers of all these people. These are all religious kids. And hundreds of kids were forced to be released from this place. To go to Yeshivot. Yankalegatim. Yankalegatim. But this is what we had to do in order to stay a people, even among ourselves, even among people that we're supposed to call our brothers. But the truth is, Rabotai, when someone is against Hashem, Hashem doesn't like them. In fact, Hashem hates them. And there are many places in the Torah that discuss this. The Gemara says that there are certain people that a Kadosh Baruch Hu loves. Person that doesn't get drunk. Person that is not precise with his character traits, meaning somebody did something wrong to you, and you say, okay, let it go. You let it go. You don't, ah, come on, you cost me. No, come on. You're one of those people? Hashem doesn't like that. Somebody did something bad to you, but you let it go. Kadosh Baruch Hu loves you. Why? Because they do it to him all day. So by you letting go and not standing on your own kavod constantly, you're being like Hashem. You're emulating Hashem. But if you constantly need to show, no, 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 but I got to show him, I got to prove him that he did something wrong, because it wasn't like that so much. I wasn't like that so much. You want Hashem to love you? Don't, uh, don't be so precise with your own kavod. Don't be so precise. Be precise with Hashem's kavod. That you have to be precise. That you have to defend. That you have to fight for. But then the Gemara says, there are certain people that Kadosh Baruch Hu hates. One, a person that says one thing and, says, and does another. Fakers. Yeah, I love this guy. In reality, he hates him. He only says, I love him because he wants him to give him a job. He's in front of him. Yeah, yeah, he's my boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In reality, five minutes after he leaves, he goes, yeah, that guy is the word. Da, 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 da. Allah shonara. Because this hate you. You do that? You say one thing, but you feel something else? Shem hates you. Give a sign. Because this sends you hate letter. Why? It doesn't like fakers. What's in your heart? That should be what's in your mouth. If what's in your heart is wrong, fix it. If what's in your heart is wrong, fix it. But to be a faker, not acceptable according to Hashem. He hates people like that. Come on. Now you're going to move in. Second. A person that doesn't stand witness for his friend when he can. Your friend is in trouble. You know that you can help him out. But like, no, but I'm busy. What are you busy with? Oh, I got work. Got to make some money. Yeah, but he's going to get in trouble if you don't help him. Ah, I'll find somebody else. Shem hates you. Why? You are able to use the Torah in order to help one of its people. But instead, you chose to help yourself, help your pocket. No good. Three. Sees his friend violate immorality crimes and goes and tells on him as a single witness. You saw your friend go to one of these clubs full of garbage. You saw one of your friends act like a she even though he's a he. You saw one of your friends do all types of things that are immoral. And you go to the bed and say, hey! This guy, Steve, yeah, he's a uh, da 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 hate you. What? Why? Shouldn't I be doing that? No. Why not? If you do that as a single witness, the bed dean can't do anything with that. Why? We have a rule in the Torah, two witnesses minimum. Which means what? You came and you said something. That's true. 
about somebody else, but the bet team can't do anything with it, what is it then? Lashonara. Lashonara. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah, Lashonara is true. If it's not true, it's rechilut. If you want to help your friend or help society, you have to have another witness. You have to have two witnesses. Two witnesses. Why are these so bad? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu's signature is emit, truth. And these are three different ways that a person didn't stand up for the truth. In his heart is one thing, in his mouth is something else. Fighting for his friend when his friend is in need as a witness. Being someone that is going to be following the Torah, two witnesses. This is also the reason why to be a criminal lawyer is forbidden according to the Torah. To be a criminal lawyer is forbidden. Why is it forbidden? Because you have to defend criminals. Even if they are criminals. Like you know he's a criminal. But you're going to convince the courtroom that the glove doesn't fit. You're going to convince the courtroom that he's not so bad. He wasn't there. He was there. But you're going to convince them that they don't have enough proof that he was there. Even though he told you under the table in between you, when you guys were having a couple of shots together, I was there. But they don't know that. They don't have proof. They don't have indisputable proof. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, but you know. Akadosh Baruch Hu knows. Are you defending a criminal? Akadosh Baruch Hu hates you. So how can you be a criminal lawyer? Only defend Sadiqim. Which is virtually impossible. Only defend people that you know for sure they are innocent. Which is virtually impossible. Why? The field of criminal law is full of criminals. You're not getting tzaddikim coming into your office every day. Who, who goes to criminal lawyer? Generally speaking, many times criminals. Which means what? You have to say one thing, but feel another. Because you know he's a criminal and you can't stand him. You agree that he should go to jail. But he just wrote you a million and a half dollar check, so let him go. Because he wrote you a check. What you said changed. And it's not in agreement to what's in your heart. What do we say about such people? Because we hate them. Why? Fake. Liars. Also, by default, being a politician is virtually impossible. The word politician comes from a Greek word of, that means tick. Like the bug that sucks your blood. Politicians are a little worse than those ticks. Why? They have to lie. In order to win, to get their agenda, they have to lie. Depends who the crowd is. Here they'll tell you yes, over there they'll tell you no. Here they're pro-God, over there they're against God. Here they're pro-abortion, there they're anti-abortion. What's going to get me more votes? To the Jewish people, we tell them we love Israel. But to the Muslim crowd, no, no, no. We're going to have a two-state solution. To the Jewish people, we're going to tell them, yeah, we got to defend God's... Act. Yeah. To all of the anti-Semites in the middle of uh, Arkansas or something, they said, we got to get rid of this Jewish problem. Just don't record me on camera. Bottom line. Politician, you have to lie. What does Shem think? He hates him. He hates people like that. Now, there are more people that Hashem hates. The Gemara Masech Nidah, page 16b, says that Hashem hates a person who enters his own house without knocking. Not somebody else's house. His own house. He's married. Now he lives by himself. He's married. His wife is home. And he decides to walk in to his house. Pays the mortgage. Pays the rent. Knock. Turns up. Puts the key in. Well, there's no, just turns on and up, okay, hey, I'm home. Shem hates him. Why? 
almost every single one of us has done this before, probably still do it. Why does Hashem hate something so particular? Just walk into my own house? It's my house. If I can't walk into my own house, where can I do it? We'll get to it. A person that urinates in an immodest way by holding his member unnecessarily. Hashem hates him. A person that urinates next to his bed. Even though he can go to the bathroom. Just decides. In those days it was more common than today because they had dirt grounds. Today most people have floors. But nonetheless, some people would get up. Many people would sleep naked in those days. There was no pajamas in like today. And they would get out of bed, urinate, and go back to bed. Shem hates you. If you do that. Why? Why? What does Shem care about that? Four. He's intimate with his wife. Or she's intimate with her husband. Next to people. There's other people in the room. Doesn't only mean the act itself. That's a given. Even other things. Next to people. Yeah, I love her. Okay, buddy. Jim hates you. Why? Why? The Midrash Rabbah, Parashat Ve'igash, chapter 95, verse 30. Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai says, Hashem hates a person who doesn't cover himself when he's intimate with his wife. He wants to be free, like a dolphin. Doesn't want to put a blanket, because he watched too many movies. He wants to make a movie. And gain home. Shem hates him. What are all these things having to do with each other? Next, Rabbi Shemo Bayechai says, in the same Midrash, Rabba, Parashat Ve'igash, he speaks, or she speaks, intimate issues that are between a husband and a wife in front of people. Oh, so what happened after the wedding? I should hate you. That's what happened. That's what happened. No, so how was the weekend? Where did you? I should hate you. That's what happened. That's how it was. Why? Why does it make? Why? What are all these are minor things. In the beginning, I said a guy's a faker, I can understand. A guy's a false witness or doesn't want to be a witness, I can understand. Those things I can understand, but what is this door? The intimacy, like what Hashem hates those people too. I mean, how many people Hashem hates a lot of people? Why? Midrash Eisenstein. In section Chupot Eliyahu. It says, what do all of these things have to do with each other? They all have one common denominator. Lack of tzniut. Lack of modesty. Guy urinates in public. With his wife in public. Talks about him and her in public. Walks around like he's some dolphin in public. And even walks into his own house without knocking. Is he modest? Why? Maybe his wife is not ready for him. Knock! Does it affect you that much? Knock! Nah, come on, it's my house! Ah, it's your house! The Midrash says, what does it mean, immodesty? What does it mean, lack of tznut? It means he's acting like an animal. An animal does not knock on the door of the farm before it enters its little 
place that it sleeps on top of the straw. It just walks in. You just walk into your own house like a cow. No consideration for your wife, no consideration for your husband, no consideration for anybody. Why? It's my place. Animals act like that. Intimate in public, animals are intimate in public. Not covering yourself, animals don't cover themselves. Urinating anywhere, animals urinate anywhere. Get a dog, I'll show you. We'll show you the living room, we'll show you the bedroom, we'll show you the kitchen, I'll show you the pillows, we'll show you everything, I'll show you a whole house, we'll show you. I'll show you the house in new ways, every day. No, no, no I'm going to train him. Until you train him, he's going to show you. Animals have no problem. In fact, you cannot be upset at them, really, for being animals. Oh, I can't believe my dog did that. What do you mean? He's a dog. What do you want him to walk around with pants on? Or maybe you want to say, excuse me, sir, can I use the toilet? He's a dog. It's a cat. That's what they do. It's not a problem if they do it. It's a problem if you do it. Why? You're not a dog. But when we act like dogs, walking in and out as if we own the place, like animals, talking about a him and her as if it's public business, like animals, HaKadosh Baruch Hu hates that. Why? I didn't create you as an animal. All of these things will be vehemently rejected by the Zionistic, socialistic, secularistic mentality. Why? This is indeed their behavior daily. Women are liberal with their body. Why can't I show my body? It's not my problem that they sin because of me. No, it is your problem, and it will be your problem. No, I, I'm just hot. That's why I walk around with no clothes on. You're a liar too, not just hot. Liar. Because if you look at the people that live in the desert, they don't walk around with tank tops, lady. The people that live in the desert, the hottest place on earth, Gainom is asking for, for some of the heat. They don't walk around with tank tops. They don't walk around with shorts. In fact, they walk around with more clothes than most of us wear in the winter. Why? Your clothes have nothing to do with whether you're hot or not. In fact, you wear more layers, many times it'll make you cooler, not hotter. Depending on the material, obviously. The only reason why you're walking around showing your body, lady, is because you want to be a mini-god. What does it have to do with anything? Mm. I spoke to a woman who used to be a model. And she told me exactly what it is. Now, I can't think like a woman, so I ask. She told me, listen, anyone that tells you otherwise is simply a liar. No woman in the world walks around immodest because she's hot. Physically hot like sun. I have to explain these things. Filthy minds. Anyway, she doesn't walk around because of heat. She's walking around because she likes to control people. Why? She walks around, someone likes the way her skin looks, her shoulder looks, her elbow looks, and who Hashem Yishmor Vyatzi looks, and she feels like a mini god. Why? Look, I walked and he turned his head. I walked there and he turned his head. I walked there and he started whistling. I walked there and he dropped something. It's like being like having a spell on the public. You just walk around. It's like a little mini god. Why? Well, you just walk around, do nothing. And people do stuff. She says, that's why women walk around immodest. It's an ego thing. It's an attention thing. And it's simply a mental thing that some women do it without even realizing it. But nonetheless, that's 100% the reason. 
You like the way you can control other people by simply existing. I walk around, all of these people stop their life and they look at me. Guess what, lady? Now I understand why the Rishit Chochmah says a woman that walks around Imadis is a Machtia Rabim and gets punished so horribly. Why? It's on purpose. All this time I always thought, you know, a woman walks around Imadis, she maybe she doesn't mean it, maybe she doesn't know, you know, that it's not her fault really. Bobkiss, a lady herself told me. It's 100% fully no known to every woman that the way she looks will cause people to do things. 100% and that's why she does it. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't need this lady to tell him. He already knows. That's why he punishes them so severely. Now, of course, if a woman doesn't know that there's a punishment, that's a different story. But if you know that there is reward and punishment, and a Kadosh Baruch Hu punishes a woman that walks around immodestly, and you still walk around immodestly, of course you deserve the punishment. You're a crazy person. But if you walked around immodest, because you like the attention, I don't blame you. I'd love to walk around the street and everybody starts screaming my name. Why, why not? Why not? Walk around, people do stuff, why not? But once you know that it's not allowed, then you realize, oh, that's why not. God said no. If it was allowed, I don't blame you for liking the attention. I don't blame you for wanting the attention. But now that you know that it's forbidden, then you have to stop. Yeah, but it's hard. Okay, it's hard to go to gain home too. Which one do you prefer? Hard here or hard there? Either way is hard. Just... One a little hotter. The point being, Abu Tai, is that a Kadosh Bahu, people always ask, well, how come the punishment is so severe for such and such? You're only going to understand tits and bits of it in the beginning, but as you learn more and more and more and more, you start realizing, wow, a Kadosh Bahu, even the punishment is merciful for such a thing. Why is the punishment merciful for such a thing? Because in reality, you walk around like this because you're seeking attention. You're seeking what? Attention away from Hashem. It's literally a God complex. Making yourself into an idol, obviously, is a very severe sin. Rav Shmuel Rozovsky from Yeshivat Ponovich wasn't exactly one to rebuke people often. Enormous Talmud Chacham, Kodesh Kodeshim. One time his Talmudim walk around, walk into his shiur. Talmudim, Shiva, Talmudim Chachamim, good people. Wait for the Rav to start the shiur. The Rav was very pedantic about starting his shiur exactly on time. But on this day, he didn't say much. A minute passed, five minutes passed. I think maybe he's getting ready, maybe this, maybe that. He doesn't feel well. Fifteen minutes pass. The Rav hasn't said a word. One of the Talmidim gets the courage and says, Kvoda Rav, you okay? Why, why are we learning? The Rav says, I don't teach animals. What? Looking. No dogs, no cats, no cows. Tell me the Yeshiva, it's a Dikim. For the Rav. Us? Why, why, why is the Rav calling us animals? The Rav says to them, I've been paying attention for a long time now. And I noticed that every time we have a shoe, a bunch of you come in, you sit down, the shoe starts, but then there's always a few of you that walk in late. But it's not enough that you walked in late. You open the door and you let it slam as if nobody else is in the room. Tah! 
Oh, to let everybody know you're here. And then there's rappers. And then there's the bottle. And then there's this. As if nobody else is in the room. Why? Because you walked in. So you don't care if there's a hundred people listening to the shoe. Why? Because you came in. So they have to be disturbed by the sound of the door and the wrapper and the bottle and then this and that. That's an animal. I don't teach animals. Many times we walk into a place not exactly on time. That by itself is not necessarily such a severe sin. It's not good. It's not a good nature. It's also disrespectful if you're constantly doing it. But it doesn't make you an animal. What makes a person an animal? Not caring about that. Meaning, you walk into the shoe, you walk into the office, you walk into the place, there are already people there. But you care less how much noise you make. Why? It's the door. What do I care about the door? What do you mean, what do you care about the door? Why do they have to hear the door because you showed up late? Why do they have to hear your bottle because you decided to drink when no one else is? Why do they have to lose their focus because of you? Ah, the world revolves around you. That's an animalistic mentality. That's an animalistic mentality. It happens many times. I'm sure you guys have seen it and even in this shoe. Somebody would walk in, everybody's focused, this, that. Even a few of you are sleeping, but somebody will wake you up. Not because of the shoe. I don't wake anybody up. Why are you waking up? Somebody with the wrapper. Or the best yet, the four ranks. Yeah, yeah, one second, I'm in a shoe. Yeah, one second. What? No, 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 I don't want it. No, no. They answer the phone in the middle of a shul. You've seen this in shuls before. Middle of prayer, Amida, somebody answers their phone and starts talking. No, no, I don't want to buy it. No, no, no. Sell, sell. They're going to sell you, Shamayim, from this chamber, that chamber, that chamber. Why? We have to be humans, not animals. What does it mean to be human? You have to care about the world around you. You can't just care about yourself, your needs, your desires. Avwasman says that unfortunately what's happening, Rabutaya Karim, is that many of these false beliefs, false ideas, false behaviors are as a result of our teaching system. Whether it be the Zionistic mentality, the secular mentality, or whatever else is in between, this is where it stems from. And he says that these false ideologies, false, uh, false beliefs, have their false prophets, meaning they have their leaders that preach this nonsense. And these false prophets do their work to perfection. And then he says something scary. A miracle has happened. Rav Wasserman is saying something you got to pay attention to. He's, after he tells us about this two forms of idolatry, socialism and nationalism, and the false prophets that HaKadosh Baruch Hu warns us against, he now says a miracle has happened. In heaven, these two idolatries have been merged into one. National Socialism. There, are, there has been formed from them a fearful rod of wrath which hits at the Jews in all corners of the globe. What is nationalism and socialism? National Socialism. What is National Socialism? Nazi. That's what the Nazis were. The abomination to which we have bowed down strikes back at us. As the prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 2, verse 19, Your sin shall punish you. A 
הקדוש ברוך הוא, in his ultimate precision, judges measure for measure by punishing us with the stick, the illegal stick that we bought. You wanted to go to nationalism instead of the Torah? You wanted to go to socialism instead of the Torah? No problem. You'll have nationalism and socialism together. What is that? Nazis. That's what the Nazis were. Hitler, Yimach Shimo Vezichro. Called the Torah the Old Testament Satan's book. And says that Yeshu, Yimach Shimo Vezichro, Yoshke, was not a Jew, but rather an Aryan who was an anti-Semite. And he brought a proof. Hitler brought a proof from the New Testament. The book of John, chapter 8, verse 44. Yeshu talks to the Jewish people and says to them, your father is the devil. And that's why he says that Yeshu was not a Jew, but rather an Aryan. And he favored the book by another Rasha named Martin Luther called Jews and Their Lies. How is this also measure for measure? Many of the Germans hated Jews for wanting to be Germans. But we're not talking about religious Jews. We're talking about Jews that have abandoned Judaism to the highest level and adopting Christianity. Marrying Christian women, marrying Christian men, and going into the church. Hitler was used as a rod by a Kadosh Baruch Hu who said, hey, what? You believe in the New Testament? The New Testament doesn't believe in you, Jew. Why? Yoshke was an Aryan. He was a Nazi. Look, I have a verse. Book of John. He hates Jews. Yoshke hates Jews. He's an anti-Semite. He gave permission for me to kill you, Hitler says, from the book you claim to believe, showing me that you don't really believe in the book, or else you would have gotten this. You would have known that there's no way for you to become a Christian. Again, fulfilling the verse that Jeremiah said, your sin will be a punishment. You see, Rabotai Karim, many times we want to do good. And we go and try to do good. But we don't try as hard as we do for other things. When you look for a job, if you're desperate, you just get whatever you can. But as soon as the desperation is out of the way, you saved a few dollars, you got good at your job, you have a few offers, you're going to try to become more selective. If you have time, you're not just going to take some potato chips and eat until you're full. What are you going to do? You're going to cook something. Or better yet, maybe you're going to order something. But you're not just going to order the first thing you see. What are you going to do? You're going to select it. You're going to think about it. Oh, no, Chinese food I had yesterday. Oh, let me have this. Let me go to this. Oh, you're going to cook. Oh, what should I cook? My guy's going to throw, take the kitchen, open all the ingredients and pour them into the pot. You're going to think about it. Oh, maybe a little basil. Maybe a little salt. Maybe a little oil. Maybe this type of oil. You're going to think about it, right? Food we think about. Jobs we think about. We don't just marry any woman that talks to us. We don't just marry any man that talks to us. We think about it. Let me go on a date. On a shidduch. Let me think about it. Let me see what he thinks. Let me think what she thinks. We think about it. So even to get married, we think about it. Before people vote, people are, actually think their votes count. So they vote. What do they do? In order to vote, they make sure to invest 
the right amount of time to watch all of these stupid debates on television, to poison their mind with more nonsense, see a bunch of grown people insult each other in public, but yet one of them is going to be your leader. It's the most absurd thing in the world. All of them are criminals, but somehow one of them is going to be a leader. But people make sure to watch every debate avidly, and the next day they talk about it to their friends. Yeah, when he said about this and that, yeah, he got her. Oh yeah, when she said this and that, she did this. And they talk about it, talk about it. Oh, I can't wait for next week's debate. Are you going to watch it? Are you going to watch it? Oh, let's watch it at my house. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like there's mice in their head, and the mice went to sleep. They're on autopilot. Neutral. But they watch it. Why? They want to invest the time before they decide who's going to be their candidate. Who's going to be their hero. Who's going to be the guy they put on the ballot that doesn't really count but makes you believe that it counts. They're going to put it. Why? They're going to do research. They're going to look on the internet, read all the articles, investigate, watch the debates, watch this, watch that. Ask your friends. Ask this. What laws is he going to pass? What laws is he say he's going to pass? How is he going to help me? How is he going to you know, stab me in the back? All these wonderful things. You do the research. Why? To maybe you're going to get this guy to stay in office for another few years. Lots of research. Hours and hours of research. So, for job, research. Food, research. Marriage, research. Political representative, research. Everything you do, research. You want to go on a trip, you're going to go and research. What's the best way to get there on a navigation? If I take the highway, if I take the turnpike, if I have a carpool, if I do it by myself, if I fly in the air, if I just stay home and pretend I went but don't go, what, what's the best way to do it? Research, right? How come we don't do the same research when it comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's emit? That's my question. Everything else we do research. How come we don't do research when it comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's emit? You heard somebody speak, and he speaks wonderfully. It's like pearls coming out of his mouth. How come you don't double check that everything he said is true? How come? How come it doesn't matter to you? Like your job, like the spouse, like Chinese food. No, don't order from that place. No, there. Uh, how come? The speaker, you just simply decide based on whether you like the way his voice sounds or his beard is long enough to your taste. But whether what he says is in accordance to Akadosh Baruch Hu's emet, that you don't verify. How come? How come you judge the book by its cover? Because he has long payout, therefore he must be righteous. How come it's so easy for you to pick the speaker that's going to determine whether you go to Genom or not, or to Gan Eden, but to pick Chinese food takes you at least an hour and a half? How come? One of the worst examples, one of the worst examples of how people are being taken advantage of in today's world, simply by judging a book by its cover and not by what's inside, is one of the people on the list named Dror Kasuto. It, by the looks of it, he looks like a good guy. Peyot from here till the end of the exile. Beard can be enough for the rest of the room. His voice, so sweet, so nice, seems like a nice guy, means well. Very friendly, charming, charismatic. You want to hug the guy, bring him home, maybe marry your kids or something. But the reality is this. He has a video on the internet. About three or four minute video. He says he spoke to God and God spoke to him back and told Dror Kasuto, thank you. A few days ago I was lying in bed before I went to sleep and I really, literally, I had a very, very deep, very spiritual vision. And, uh, and I could see many things and I could see how Hashem Barach, he, he brought down the world and how He created the world and, and, and I saw very, very deep things.
very huge things, very amazing, very uplifting and, and inspiring things with my own eyes, spiritual eyes, in my own mind, in my own heart. And and I could hear I could hear the will of Hashem. I could hear I could hear him and the main thing that Hashem Barach told me, and I know it's hard, it's hard to understand, but the main thing that Hashem Barach told me was, in that vision, was, was thank you. He thanked me. And it's crazy. But uh, it's written on Hashem Barach that in, his, in the place of His greatness, that's where you can find His humility. The greatness of a person is his humility, how humble he is. And, and Hashem Barach chose to tell me thank you on the fact that from the moment that he woke me up from my deep sleep of being secular and far from faith and far from, from any connection to reality and spirituality. So from that moment that he woke me up I never stopped for a second to reveal his godliness and his greatness and to help other people and to support. And he mentioned that to me and he told me those things. And it's very humbling to to hear Hashem say thank you to you. It's very humbling. Immediately you just want to tell him, who am I? that you're going to speak to me? Who am I that you're going to tell me? Who am I that you're going to thank me? But that is the truth. Now you may not think that's a problem, but Moshe Rabbeinu says in this week's parasha, Rabotai Yekarim, if a person says that he's a prophet and he's not, death penalty. Now we don't have a permission to kill anybody. So in today's world it's death by heaven. But the truth is Rabotai, someone that says that God speaks to them and they speak back. In essence they're having a conversation with God. That's prophecy. That's prophecy. Now if you had your own crazy dream and you think God spoke to you and you spoke to Him back, no problem. Keep it to yourself. But once you publicize it to the people, either you're a mental case or you are a liar. Because prophet, for sure you're not. There's no more prophecy today. Rav Kanievsky is not a prophet. Rav Mazuz is not a prophet. Rav Sternbach is not a prophet. Biggest rabbinim in the world are not prophets. To even say someone has Ruach HaKodesh is so far-fetched that if you tell the rabbis, yeah, you have Ruach HaKodesh, they'll slap you in the face if they could. It's like, what, are you crazy? Do you know what Ruach HaKodesh is? Prophecy is higher than that. Someone to make a video saying, God spoke to me, said thank you to me. That's Navi Shekel. Number two. He has a video. It's a clip out of another one of his videos where he says outright, I hold that marijuana is good for you. It's allowed. Especially if it helps you. Learn Torah, do mitzvot, live life. It's medicine. Torah Kasuta said. I'm holding grass, weed, marijuana as medicine, as drug that is a real medicine. And you need to know how to use it and when to use it. And if your senses are strong and pure and powerful, so you can know it about yourself. You can have a self-awareness to know if it's building you or destroying you. If you're using it for a good cause or if your evil inclination is using you to kick you down to sadness and, and to many lackings that it can bring. A person now, in a certain stage of his life, is using a certain drug in a good way that is building him, that is supplying something good for him in his life, still, that's my thought, I think that it is only waking him up. 
the Gdola Dor in the previous generation of Moshe Feinstein, Paskins, anyone that smokes marijuana recreationally, not medicinally, recreationally, is considered a Ben Sorer Umore according to Allah, which according to the Torah is death penalty. Again, death penalty by heaven, not by us. Smoking marijuana is forbidden by the Torah if it's recreational. If it's medicinal, that's a different issue and it's paskin differently. Meaning, if that's the only thing that works on you and you've tried everything else that doesn't make you high, and this is the only thing that works for you, then there may be a permission for you to use it, but in reality today, by Chazdei Hashem, there is something called CBD, which allows you to have the same medicinal effects without the high. Which goes back to the Psaq of Ramosh Feinstein, not allowed to smoke marijuana. But Trokasuta doesn't care what Rav Moshe Feinstein said. Doesn't care. Rabbi Vadya Allah Shalom. One of the greatest rabbis that ever lived, not just in the recent generation, ever, one time came to America. And he went to visit Rav Moshe Feinstein when he was still alive. And he says to his helper as he's about to leave the car, please pray for me the whole time I'm there that I come out alive. Where's he going? To ISIS? He's going to see the Gdola He's going to see Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Moshe is going to see Rav Moshe Feinstein. Why are you asking him to, to pray for you to, that you stay okay, that you stay alive? The bigger the Chacham, the bigger the fear of another Chacham. Why? Because you realize this is the Moshe Rabbeinu. You don't go give a high five to Moshe Rabbeinu. When Rav Ovadia went to go visit Rav Moshe Feinstein, he tells, his, he tells his, his helper, please pray for me that I come out alive. That's how much afraid he was of meeting the Gdol Adol, not going against him, meeting him, sitting with him, saying hello, afraid to death. But Dror Kasuta, ah, we don't have to listen to Rav Moshe Feinstein. I hold, I hold, he says. Marijuana is okay. Another video. He's in a store full of Christmas stuff for the Goyim. He said, why? You guys are afraid of Christmas? I love Christmas. <laughs> I love Christmas. We don't have to pay everywhere. I love Christmas. Anyone that read a little bit of history knows that Christmas is one of the worst days for the Jewish people throughout all of history. Aside from the fact that the Nazis made it a special day to kill Jewish people. And Christian people for the last 2,000 years made it a special day to kill Jewish people. Now when this idiot, Dro, went to a Christmas store because he likes the way Christmas is and he was surrounded by all types of Christmas carols, apparently he didn't read any history because you know how those, all those, all those decorations, all those decorations on the tree started? You can look up history yourself. They used to take body parts of Jewish people they killed and put them on a tree. But Dro likes Christmas. Now, I don't know if that's pure stupidity or stupidity, but nonetheless, anyone knows a Jew says he likes Christmas, that's, you're a rabbi, that's what you say. That's the Torah of Hashem. That's the representation for Am Yisrael, you like Christmas? 500,000 Jews have been stolen, stolen from us by the Christians over the last 20 years, converted to Christianity. And that's what you say, you like Christmas? You're not afraid of it? And happy Hanukkah, happy holidays. Merry Christmas to the Christians. To everyone, yeah. Bibi Netanyahu made a great video now that he, he blessed all, the, all our Christian friends with happy uh, uh, Christmas. Merry Christmas. We live in a world with more people than us. People, have they have different beliefs, they have different everyone. cultures, they have different understandings, and bless them, like whatever, whatever they see. Another video called Jewish Sex 2. This video, Rabotai Karim, is simply filth upon filth. With this draw, this atzitz, this plant, says at about the first six minutes of the talk, if your wife doesn't want to be with you, go to a prostitute. 
השם ישמור ויציל. No, but I'm losing my mind. I'm getting crazy. And those disgusting men are going to their wives. I'm going to have zera lebatala. I won't control myself. I'm going to have dreams. My seed, my sperm, my whatever. Go to hell. Go deal with your problems. Go to a therapist. Go to a prostitute. Leave your wife alone. What are you talking about? Another video called the rabbi's different approach to homosexuality. He talks about homosexuals not being so bad, not a big deal. They're born that way. The stuff he says about Shabbat is completely a desecration of Hashem's name. And that it's really, what's written in the Torah, it's really not the will of Hashem, even though it says so. It's not the will of Hashem. Like it's written, whatever is written in the Torah, that's not really what Hashem wants. It's not really what Hashem wants. I want to tell you that I don't see them so guilty like that you, like that you explain them. I know what's written in the Torah Kedusha. Right. The Torah Kedusha is saying that it's not allowed, right. and that you need to kill the person that done that. But you know that it's written also on a person that breaks Shabbos, that violates Shabbos, that you need to kill him, execute him. You ask your question. Right. That's what it's written. So. Are we really going to take a gun and start going and, and slaughtering people, shooting people? And, no. So we are, and, 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 and we understand that it's not, why not? Why not? ISIS are doing it. Right. We don't think that that's the will of Hashem, right? right? Inside, even though that it is written in the Torah, that if a person just violated Shabbos, he, he, he destroyed Shabbos, he, he lit the fire, he turned on his car and drove to the sea in Shabbos, the Torah is saying you need to kill him. Right. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't believe that that is the real will of Hashem in Barach, even though that it's written in the Torah. We're going to put all of our effort to read between the lines and to understand what is the real intention, the real meaning of Hashem in Barach, right? So, now I'm going to tell you. First of all, I want to tell you that this is a question that even huge righteous people that I met with and that I spoke with, they didn't know the answer. They still don't know the answer on that. The answer of what? Like why of why people are suffering so much and why people are coming to those places because it's a problem in their souls, in their, in their nefesh, in their spirits. Let, I know people that from age of three, they already felt like they are in a, in a wrong body. Right. Men that felt like women from age of three. They feel like I'm a little girl that trapped in a boy's body. Like, in essence, the Torah is wrong. Another video called, Does God Want Religious Robots? In the last 24 minutes. He says you shouldn't keep Shabbat from fear and be a slave. And then he says verbatim, I promise you, nothing will happen to you if you don't keep Shabbat. Nothing will happen to you. Just don't keep it from fear. Nothing will happen to you. If you don't keep it, nothing can happen to you. In so many words, you just took the Torah and threw it in the garbage pail. How can we even accept judgments? How can we? Okay, there are so many judgments. This is why people are falling from their faith in God to believe that God is Father of mercy. But if you're just going to investigate with yourself, observe who is God for you, for you. Who is He? For who you have keep on your head, for who you go to pray, for who you put fill in, for who you keep Shabbos. If you have some ruler, some strict master, some, some I don't know what, someone that you're afraid from punishment, drop, the, drop your nonsense, don't go to shul anymore, don't keep Shabbos. What, are you crazy? To be a slave for that? To be a slave, to be afraid of punishment for that you go to shul? I promise to you, nothing going to happen to you. Don't go to shul, don't put your kippah, don't keep Shabbos, don't eat kosher. Adraba, go enjoy life. If you do it out of fear, are you... After the fuck? Are you crazy? Another video, he says outright, the Shulchan Aruch needs to change. The Shulchan Aruch needs to change. Rabotai Karim, this statement alone obligates us to put such a person on nidui, 
not allowed to walk into a bit knesset, into your house, until he does outright tshuva publicly. Just for that statement alone. Forget everything I just said. Shuhan Aruch has to change. There are a lot of things that are bent today, but you cannot straight them up. If you're going to try to straight them up, you're going to break them. If you're going to take even our mindset of how we're serving Hashem Yidvach, and you're going to try to put us into the Shulchan Aruch, like the Shulchan Aruch is saying, you're going to kill us, you're going to kill me. Me, take me, that I'm Haredi, that I keep Shabbat, and I'm eating kasher, and every day I'm waking up and as early as I can, and I'm putting tefillin, rashi, and rabbinu tam, and everything I'm trying to do is, the best is, force me to, to keep the Shulchan Aruch, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm not able to do it today. It's not in my ability. For sure it's going to destroy my family, it's going to destroy my wife, my children. Our family is going to break to pieces. It's I'm not going to hold on. So to take someone that's even more bent than I, there are people that are even more bent than I, and take them into the Shulchan Aruch and try to, you just, it means to cut them to pieces and to put those pieces inside the Shulchan Aruch. You cannot bring them into it. So, Hashem Itbarach needs to reveal to us the Torah that is Atika Setima, that is ancient and is hidden from us. Another lecture called Hello Darkness My Old Friend in Manhattan, New York says if the wife doesn't want to go to the mikveh don't divorce her. Don't do anything ever. Another person, his wife, she's telling him, I don't want to go to mikveh. I don't want to dip. Okay, what do you want him to do? What do you want him to do? Divorce her? If he will divorce her, he lost his house. What do you want him to do? Okay, he goes to that rabbi. Okay, you need to divorce her. Go to the other rabbi. Look, you're not allowed to divorce. Okay, what do what you want him to do? What can he do? He cannot do anything. Divorce her, he doesn't want to, he doesn't feel it's the right way, he loves her, he knows she loves him, it's a problem, she doesn't want to go. What are you going to do? You're stuck, right? Great. What you should do? Stay stuck. Pray to Hashem, call Hashem, count on Hashem. There is nothing to do. One rabbi can tell you divorce, one rabbi is going to tell you you're not allowed to divorce your wife. No, you're not divorced. Never, ever, you're not divorced. Someone else will tell you, yes, you must. Yes, there are. Many, many rabbis that will tell you. How are you going to count on a rabbi? How are you going to count on an opinion when you have another opinion that can be as strong that will tell you the opposite? What are you going to do? Who are you going to call? Ghostbuster? Halachai is, your wife doesn't want to go to the mikveh. You have to go to a rabbi, tell him this. You try to help her do tshuva. She simply doesn't want to do it ever. Divorce. That's the one thing. That's the one thing we don't play around with. Why? Without our going to the mikveh, you're not even allowed to touch her finger. There is no marriage without, without tarat mishpacha. Your wife doesn't want to go to the mikveh, you must divorce her. Must. Even if she violates Shabbat, you stay married. She eats non kosher, you stay married. But she doesn't want to go to the mikveh, you have to get a divorce. Of course, you got to try, talk to your Rav, how much you try to get her to do tshuva if you both were secular and you're only doing tshuva right away, but it's a very, very time-sensitive issue. Why? You're not allowed to be in the same house as her. But Troll, Troll says, no, don't worry about it. Don't listen to the rabbi. Don't listen to the rabbi. Then the same lecture, he says that David Melech was in Geinom. King David was in hell, and King David was in the lowest place in hell, and he said that. Even if I walk in the valley of death, I cannot see anything bad. Hey, you're walking in the valley of death. I cannot see anything bad. Nothing is bad. It's all good. All good. You are in the valley of death. What are you talking about? David Melech, Melech Mashiach. David Melech was in Geinom according to Torah Kasuto. Why? He wrote a Tehilim, and he became the commentary on it. He says, look, David Amir says, even if I'm in the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in Genom, then I won't be afraid. 
What does David Amelech say? Hashem, I'm even when I'm dealing with Genom problems, meaning I'm dealing with problems, even if it's dark, even if it looks like there's nothing going for me, I know it's you, you, you're my, you're my shepherd. Not that David Amelech was in Genom, you imbecile. Read commentary once in your life. But this is the, this is the shepherds of today. It says David Amelech was in Genom, Hashem Yishmo Ve'atzil. Another lecture called How to Live Our Lives in Crown Heights, New York, between the 39th and 44th minute. He distorts the whole concept of sin, where he says, if a woman doesn't want to keep Shabbat, doesn't want to keep Shabbat, she wants to drive on Shabbat. And he says, the husband, he's keeping Shabbat, but his wife doesn't want to keep Shabbat. But you know what? If he violates Shabbat, for the sake of Shlom Bayit, that's, Hashem likes that. He said, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but Hashem likes it. That's, a, that's better than somebody. It's like, where, which toilet did you get this from? Which bathroom did you buy this book? Where did you get this? A couple, they are married, and she doesn't want to keep Shabbat, and he is a Baal Shuvah, and he decided now to start keeping Shabbat in the middle of their life together, and she is telling him, listen, I'm driving in Shabbat, I couldn't care less about your nonsense, because she doesn't understand <laughs> what he's talking to her about, and he's sending her to the mikveh, and he wants her to cut her fingernails, and he wants her to cut her, cover her head, and like, He's the most sickest person she ever met in her life. That's not the one that she got married with three years ago. Like, it's a totally different person. Great. So now he is finding himself in a huge conflict, in a crazy situation. Like, his rabbi for sure is about to kill him if he will drive to shul in Shabbat. But it's at least 45 minutes walk. He lives in, in Cleveland, in, in Vancouver. I don't know where he lives. And then he needs to walk for 45 minutes to shoot. He's not going to do that, especially not in the rain, especially not in the winter. What he's supposed to do? So, I will say that that person doesn't know what to do with himself. And he tried to ask his rabbi, and he found a very... Yes, and he, he wants to keep Shabbat, and he doesn't know what to do. His wife, she wants to violate Shabbat. She doesn't care about Shabbat. She never felt the taste of Shabbat. She was not going to those classes that he went. She didn't hear all of those conversations. She doesn't come from a, 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 a traditional house. She never experienced all of those things. She is from a different world. She is 100% secular, and she couldn't care less about Judaism. And now he wants, but she's Jewish, and he wants to keep Shabbat, and he wants to go back to his roots. And he finds himself in a conflict, in a very hard situation. And he called his rabbi. He tried to do everything by the book, and he called his rabbi, and his rabbi told him, you must divorce her. She's a stubborn woman, she's a refusing woman, you need to divorce her. I think that there are maybe 2,000 phone calls like that in a week, only in New York, of uh, rabbis that are answering husbands that have issues with their wives. You must divorce her. The easiest answer in the world. Many, many answers like that. Okay, now what are you going to do with that crazy answer? He doesn't want to divorce her. He loves her. And he understands that she does not understand what did he understand. He's got mercy and love and patience and he wants to work with her. And he doesn't want to push her. He's a fantastic, amazing husband that wants to help his wife. And his wife now, she is refusing. She doesn't want to hear about it. Now, what should he do? He doesn't know. He called one rabbi, he called another rabbi, a third rabbi told him, you need to go and do six hours, it would do to go to Abin Ahmad, rest of seal. He doesn't know what to do. So now, what that person supposed to do? So I will tell you that I'm now not going to answer the halachic answer of that case, of that situation. Let's try to stay focused. But what does that have to do with the I'll answer that I ask? one second. Okay. I'll explain to you. So now, first of all, in that situation, so a question in addition to the question that I asked. In now, in that situation now, I'll try to explain and to come back. Okay. 
that person now is standing in a conflict, in a very hard situation. Now, what he supposed to do, he doesn't know. So he, and I'm not saying that that is the right way. I'm not saying that that's the halachic answer and that's what he should do. But I'm saying that that confused husband doesn't know what to do with himself. He feels lost. He feels confused. He doesn't know what to do. And he now is choosing to drive in Shabbat for his wife. And he is apologizing to Hashem. And he will say to Hashem, listen Hashem, I'm sorry, I don't want to violate Shabbat, I don't want to do that. And he will feel sorrow while driving every Shabbat that he will drive, and he is doing it to keep his wife close to him, and slowly, slowly to help her, to bring her to the right path. So when he will drive like that in Shabbat, it means to sin for Hashem. A guy is violating Shabbat for Shlom Bait, Hashem likes this? Where? Where? Show me one Chacham in the world that said such a thing. Now the lecture. It's very common among his behavior, both in lectures and also from people that know him from when the time that he was in Yeshiva. Hashem Yishmo, he was actually in Yeshiva, but they threw him out. He doesn't tell people that, but they threw him out. I know this for a fact. Why they threw him out? Two main things bother the rabbis over there. One, he's very pro-drugs. Two, he's very pro-homosexuality. And he does this in lectures also. Justifies homosexuality in one of the lectures. Pacifying the whole situation. He said, I spoke to somebody, I met to somebody, and he told me that from the time when he was three years old, he felt like a woman. And you know what? I think he's right. You hear people that are telling their life story that they are a man, that he wants to be homosexual, that he, that he is a homosexual. He feels like a woman. I spoke once with a person. He told me that from the age of four, he said as a kid, he's a homosexual, a clothes designer. He's saying from the age of four, I couldn't play with trucks. I couldn't care less about games of, of boys. It, it, it wasn't making me happy. But instead, I wanted always to have dolls and to put dresses on them and to, and to play games of girls. He said when, I, when he was 14 and he came to tell his father that he is for sure homosexual and, and, and he doesn't know what to do with himself. So his father told him, I know. It's obvious. We, we know you. It's okay. Kilo. There's nothing to talk about. It's, it's you. What can you say to a person like that? That it's not allowed by the rules of the Torah? Okay, I hear you. Can you take that person now and, 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 and kill him? What, what have he, what's his crime? I'm asking about that four years old kid that he wants to be a woman. That he feels that there is a woman lives inside of him. For the other side, take a woman that she's a girl. She cannot stand it. She wants to be a boy. Okay, the rules of the Torah are saying it's not allowed. I understand. There are horrible judgments on the head of that person. I understand. I read that parasha. I read the halacha. I know. I'm with you. Can you execute it? Can you bring it down? Can you make it happen? Or that you're going to feel compassion on that poor person? Why? Because you can understand him. There are situations in life that you cannot cut them with a knife. You cannot just say, no, it's not allowed. We're not uh, Daesh. The new Islamic uh, state. This is simply just saying that God makes mistakes. Now, to elaborate, there are people that are born with feminine personality. Not that they, doesn't mean they like men like men. They just have a feminine personality. And certain women that are born with masculine personality. That doesn't mean that she needs to marry another woman. What it means 
is that you have feminine traits and you're a guy, most likely you will be attracted to a masculine woman. Simple. Not that you'll be, not that if you have feminine uh, uh, personality traits, that means that you're a woman. Only an idiot would think such a thing. You have feminine traits, no problem. You probably, not always, but probably will be more attracted to the opposite, which means a masculine woman, which is also the opposite for her. And the same thing for a woman. If you're born where you have masculine traits, you would need a feminine man. Simple. God doesn't make mistakes. But according to the law, no, from the time he was three years old, he knew he liked guys. Show me one three-year-old in the world that even knows what his member is. He knows he likes guys. A rabbi says this, fuma but pee. Did me have dust in his mouth? Next. Another lecture at the 57th minute. He says, you don't have to learn Torah in order to find the will of Hashem. I'm telling you that the wisdom that I achieved, and that's the wisdom that you're now enjoying from in my classes, is not what that I read in the books. It's from my understandings between the lines. That's where I really bought my wisdom from. That is what that I'm sharing with you. Not the Midrashim and the verses that I remember and all the Gemara that I remember. It's not it. It's the will of Hashem that hides itself between the lines. So, other people that sat with me in the same Bet Midrash and reading from the same books and finished the same Masechot and might even finish more, but their heart was not aimed in the same way that mine was, they didn't receive what did I read between the lines? They didn't came out with the right conclusions that I came out from the limun with. Why? Because they were busy in the sugiah itself. They wanted to understand the words of the Tana. And I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I was looking for the will of Hashem. So I found it. You're going to find what that you are looking for. That's what you're going to find. So if you really want to be close to Hashem, you're going to find that. And you can find it choosing cucumbers in the grocery store, in the supermarket. Because Hashem is with you in every place. You don't need to find Hashem in Baruch only over there, in the highest places of the mall. There are many, many stories of Moshe Rabbeinu, or Abraham, or Yitzchak, or Yaakov, or the rest of the righteous people that were doing other things except of learning Torah 24 hours in a row. No. They were doing many other things. How can you find, how, how, how do you know the will of Hashem then? From your own mind. From your own mind. That's how you know the will of Hashem. Now you understand how he got all these commentaries. His own mind. Now the lecture. He says outright, it's good advice to keep mitzvot, but connection of sins to punishment is in your mind. Maybe Hashem will change the rules. Uh, mitzvot, the obligations, eating tavin. Good advice. It's a good advice to keep Shabbat. It's a good advice to eat kosher. It's a very good advice to cover your head. It's a good advice to put filin in the morning. That's how Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is choosing to offer the mitzvot to those people that will read, read the Zohar Kadosh in the future. That's how he is explaining to you what's actually going on in giving the Torah to our nation, to reveal the wisdom of Hashem to the world. It's a good advice. It's a good way to run your life. It's a good thing for you to wake up in the morning, to wash your hands, to brush your teeth, to go to shul, to pray, to praise Hashem, to thank Hashem, to ask your requests on your needs, and to do tshuva, to confess, to share, to have an opportunity to open up, to open your heart, to share, to talk. Great, and then it's always Good to know that you live in a Jewish community. It's good advice. There is wisdom in it. It's not a set of rules 
that comes in, in ten volumes that you have to keep them all and or else you're dead. No, it's, that, it doesn't work like that. Who likes to be rebuked? Who is uh, enjoy to be threatened and, and, and pushed and, 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 and forced to do things? None of us. It's not the right way and it's also not Hashem's way. And you can ask, okay, so why there are so many judgments in the world? Why there is so much anger in the world, so much cruelty in the world? The fact that you are connecting the judgments and the difficulties that you go through in life to your sins is because that someone made that connection in your mind. But it's not that you really saw in your life that after that you did something wrong, you've been punished. It's not that you recognize that personal supervision of Hashem that after that you do something good, you're being rewarded, and that after that you do something bad, you're being punished. You haven't seen that. I promise you, you haven't seen that. Maybe you imagined that you saw it. Maybe you thought, but only because that you heard that this is how it happens. You said, oh, he deserves it. Oh, she deserves it. Oh, it's your imagination. It was your thoughts that were connecting those two things together. But really, you don't know how the personal supervision of Hashem is working in His world. We don't know the reward on the mitzvot, and we don't know the punishments on the sins. And we don't even know exactly how they take place in the world. We can just assume, or to hear a lecture of some wise guy, the things that he knows all, and he's going to tell us exactly what's going to happen to us. He knows, like he knows. How do you know? And how do you know maybe Hashem will change it? In so many words, it's good for you to keep mitzvot. It's good. But the fact that you think that you get punished if you don't keep them, not just in your mind. Because maybe Hashem is going to change his mind. There's an outright verse. Outright verse by even the biggest rasha that ever lived. Bil'am. Bil'am a rasha. Even knew more than Druk Asuto. Saying a Kadosh Baruch Hu does not change his mind. He's not a man. But Druk decided to change the Torah. He says maybe Hashem is going to change his mind. Like as if he's a man. As if he smokes marijuana like Dol Kasuto. One before last, he says, anyone that teaches the preparation of judgment before Rosh Hashanah, and anyone that teaches Musar, is simply crazy talk. You know, because even the most pacifying rabbis will sometimes talk about Judgment Day during the lectures during Elul, which is coming up this, this week is Rosh Chodesh Elul. Everyone knows this next month is Judgment. We have to all get prepared because Rosh Hashanah is Judgment Day. Hashem decides the fate of all of us, all of mankind. All of the animals, all of everything is decided in Rosh Hashanah. So everyone obviously has to be prepared because it's Judgment Day. Judgment Day is a serious day. And then you have Yom Kippur. But no, Dokazuto, no, no, he wants to be a different. How is he different? He says, no, anyone that teaches about Judgment Day, it's crazy talk. Why? Right, they teach you to be scared. They're going to teach you about punishment. No, only crazy, crazy people do that. Those very hard and strict classes, preparation for Rosh Hashanah, preparation for, for Yom Kippur, preparation for, 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 for Shovavim, I don't know what. Except of those crazy classes that you heard, from your life experience, when you had Hashem in your life, what you felt, when you lit the candles for Shabbat, when you go to the mikveh, when you wash your hands before you eat, when you came and you kissed the mezuzah, when you come to your house, when you look at the face of your children, when you, when you went first time in your life to shul, in your bar mitzvah, in your bat mitzvah, like, who is Hashem? I'm asking you, who is Hashem? Who is Hashem for you? So serve Him. So build a relationship with Him. And not with that one that this crazy person is talking about all day long. Oh, you don't know what will happen. They gonna Dogs will bite you. They're going to chase after you. People that are talking Lashon Ara, People that are violating Shabbat. They don't have a share in the world to come. Come on! In so many words, any Gdol Adol. Any big rabbi, any righteous rabbi that ever existed from the time of Avraham Avinu all the way to today, draw Kasuda, just throw him in the garbage.
He tells Goim, I even have the screenshot. A guy that's a Christian asks him, can I keep Shabbat? Dor Kasuta says yes. The guy even says, but somebody says now aloud. No, no, it's okay. No problem. Keep Shabbat. The Rambam writes that a guy that keeps Shabbat it's death penalty from heaven. Why? It's considered stealing. Shabbat is for Jewish people alone. You could have a dinner if you want. You could not work if you don't feel like working, but not because of Shabbat. You can make it a special day if you want, but you cannot keep Shabbat like Jews. But Dor Kasuta? Ah. Come on, who's going to let some alacha get in the way of making people happy? Now, as I said, he says outright, even have the transcript, that the Shulchan Aruch needs to change. Now, it doesn't mean anything about the way you should live your life. It doesn't mean anything about the halakha that needs to be changed right now. It doesn't mean that you need to follow something else except for the most hardcore, old school, traditional Judaism that passed to you from your great grandparents until today. It does not change anything. Just we're trying to create tolerance. Now we've mentioned this this thing called Dror Kasuto in the past. Why do we mention it now? Because now it's getting worse. Aside from more people watching, more people failing, more people getting further from Hashem and closer to Dror, this guy just started a conversion program. He started a conversion to Dror Judaism. But he calls it Judaism. With Dror, conversion, where he charges people money to watch YouTube videos that are free. He charges them 50, 60, 100 dollars a month, whatever they can get, plus this, plus that, plus this. Poor people that want to get close to Hashem that watch this plant on YouTube, they think that he's righteous because he looks like he is. And they don't know the difference of Aleph Bed. They don't know nothing. Now they're paying this guy, and their mama's falling victim to this guy. If that's not enough, he says he has a Bedin. What's the Bedin? No one knows. Because they refuse to answer the question from different people that have asked. Whether those people were from India or Arkansas or Texas or Wisconsin or New York. No, we're not really sure the Bedin. Maybe we'll use one or maybe the other. But which one? Which one? Maybe it's going to be in Florida. Maybe, but which one in Florida? Who? Who are the rabbis? Who has the Bedin? Who? Yeah, and they dodge the question. Just Can you send me the money though? That they don't dodge. Can you send me the money? Can you send it? Who's running the program? Who's running the program? A guy that's not even Jewish is running the conversion to Judaism program because he probably converted through the fake conversion program by Dor Kasuto. How do I know? This guy came to me two, three years ago, asked me to help him convert. And I couldn't help him convert because he's simply not someone that's qualified to be a Jew. He's barely qualified to be a human, if you know some of the personal things that I know about him. But this guy is spearheading a conversion program. Using Dor Kasuto as the Mara de Atra. How many more Erev Rav are going to come to Am Yisrael from this guy? On one hand, I feel bad for the people that are fall victims to his hands. On another hand, I know HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in his ultimate mercy, is only going to let certain people fall into his hands because they want to fall into his hands. But that doesn't mean that we stay quiet. The damage continues to grow because no one is doing enough. Ourselves included. We do a lot of things behind the scenes that I don't talk about. And I promise you that we're doing a lot of different things, but it's still not enough. Why? He's still there. And so are the other Reshaim on the list. In fact, many of them are getting even more popular as a result of it. But you have to protest. Why? If we don't fight for Hashem, who will? 
Who will fight for Hashem? Hashem, if Hashem fights for himself, it's not good for us. It's not good for us. So this is why, Rabotai Karim, you have to warn people that there are people that look religious, they sound religious, they even speak, speak religious talk. But just like you invested a certain amount of time before you chose what to eat tonight, just like you invested a certain amount of time before you chose a certain job to apply for or a certain customer to do business with, just like you invested a certain amount of time before you chose who to get married to, just like you invested a certain amount of time before you do anything else in your life, please, please, I beg you, invest a little bit more time investigating whether the speaker is speaking what Hashem said or what's in his mind. Because according to Droll, if it's in your mind, that's good. But if Hashem said it in the Torah, it's not good. Because if it's written in the Torah, according to Droll, it's not necessarily what the will of Hashem is. What's the will of Hashem? What's in your mind, he says. What's in your heart? Even though there's a mitzvah, we say every single day in Shema Yisrael, Don't follow your heart, don't follow your eyes. Meaning that what's in your heart will steer you wrong, not right. But that's why it's our obligation not only to investigate more time, at least as much as we do for other things, but also fight against it. But why do we fight against it? We're not all speakers. We're not all speakers. So how do we all fight against it? There's a lot of different ways. You could fight against it by supporting the people that do fight against it. In a million different ways. There's money, there's time, there's skill. But also, you could even do it for free. How? Press share on the lectures. Share them with other people. Yeah, but what if they don't like what you say? That's my problem, not yours. You just do what you're supposed to do. Share. If you can't even do that, in Shemaim, they're going to ask you, money you didn't want to give, time you didn't want to give, skill you didn't want to give, what did you give? Not even share? Not even share? You can't even share? You can't even share the word of Hashem. You understand what I'm saying? This is why the deen is so harsh. And that's why Barak says in the Torah, someone who doesn't fight for Hashem, Rabotai, it's a curse. I don't want to live in a cursed. I don't want you to live as a cursed. Truth is, Rabotai, we all have to be on the same team. We have to do whatever we can to fight the war of Hashem. Not because He needs us, but because we're given the opportunity to do it. Bezat Hashem, next week, We'll continue this series tomorrow night. We have uh, same uh, here, same place, nine o'clock. We'll do our um, uh, questions and answers, and maybe we'll go over something in regards to uh, mezuzot uh, that I want to show you guys. Maybe we'll do that tomorrow or maybe next week. But we'll see. Bezod Hashem. Baruch Adonai leolam. Amen v'amen. B'shem Hashem Nasev and Atzliach. We are very excited to offer you the new Bezod Hashem app 3.0. It's a newer, faster app, full of Torah, lots of Kedusha by uh, the Shurim that we do, myself, Rabbi Ephraim, Rav Chaim, uh, where you'll have uh, also newer features where you're able to use the app uh, while you're using other applications on your phone. You'll be able to share the, uh, the lectures directly from the app. You'll be able to donate online and support our Cube and our Torah work that we're doing. And the most exciting feature is that you'll be able to actually ask questions directly on the app and get answers from the rabbis directly from the app. This is something unprecedented, and Baruch Hashem will be able to offer it. Thank you again for all of your support. Check it out. Make sure you have the kosher Torah that uh, will re-energize your neshama each and every single day. Call to B'chavat